Okay, everybody ready? I call the May 4th, 2017 meeting of the Design Review Board to order. And first, uh, I guess we note a quorum present. And the first item on the agenda is to address the minutes. We have two sets of minutes before us, the March 2nd, 2017, and the April 6th, 2017 regular meetings. Do we have any comments, questions, or concerns? I move we approve them. Okay, Sydney, do, do we need one action or two? Does it matter? One's fine. One's fine. It, okay. you, your motion is to approve both Different sets. Days. Okay. Do we have a second? A second. Any further discussion? A uh, quick question there. I just okay. see on page four there's a question mark. It looks like there's an un. I guess we should kind of resolve this. this under, the, the April, under the April discussion minutes. after the motion on item, the Todd and Kitty Whitney sign deviation item, the first one. This is on March. March. Are you March. looking at March? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. That's page five, page four. Um, about half, three lines down, there's a question mark in there, and I, and I don't know what it means either. Well, there's Dewey's on yeah. top of their sign. What then? With the proofers above. The proofers. Uh, I know what word to call that because the little, you guys call them winky dings. And that's what they oh, called okay. it, yeah. Yeah. Winky, winky dings or winky dings. Yeah, but the motion, somebody said something that I just could not understand uh, in the recording. I could not <coughs> figure out what that word was. I would well, just, I think Lourdes made, made the motion. Yes, but she did say winky dings. Just call it accents. Is that good for everybody? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. I think that captures the spirit of yeah. Lourdes' <laughs> motion. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any further questions, comments, or concerns? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. And um, just as a uh, question is, what's the best way to handle the signed copy? Should I wait for a, a, an adjustment to be made to that or just manually line it through? And uh, You can <clears throat> just write through, actually. Okay. The signature is on a separate page, so you can. That's fine. Just okay it. it. Okay. Perfect. All right. I'll take care of that in a second. Yeah. All right. Next on the agenda is announcements. No staff, you have any announcements? No announcements. Okay. Next item are the items to be heard. Uh, first up is uh, Alvin's Island Monument sign. Tim Brown. And I am, uh, have recused myself and filed the appropriate documents. Good evening. Tim Brown with Planning and Development. This item was continued from our last meeting. Uh, you guys did not feel that this proposed sign was architecturally compatible with the building. So I emailed them, or this gentleman that's handling it the next day, with your suggestions. I did not get a response. So last week I emailed him again, did not get a response. I emailed him a third time this week, and I handed out his reply, which basically says, we'll do whatever the DRB wants us to do. And that's all I got. No new sign graphic, no changes to what was presented. So I think this is up to the board what they want to do. But we suggest no more continuances. It's been continued three times. We would rather it not be continued again. Either table it or do something else. Okay, so the staff report says... That it's in it's in compliance with the technical requirements. Okay. And our, our minutes from last month have some of the suggestions we made. If that will help us to get to. But there and I is, wrote them down. I, I mean, I emailed you, them the next on. day. Not with me, but I I did not bring them with me. But I did write them down. They have okay. another Alvin's Island on Old 98 that mm -hmm. has two brand new signs that actually mimic what we had recommended. Yeah, I approved those signs on Scenic Gulf Drive and Holiday Road. There's going to be a new, they haven't built it yet, but they're going to tear that building down and build a new Alvin's Island there. Okay. That sign would be fine. That's what we had requested if they want to go with yeah, that. Yeah, that's, uh, I don't know why they're varying with this. I mean, it's a different sign company. It's a local, th these people are in South Florida. I think Dania Beach. Um, I don't know why. They didn't get someone local like they did on Scenic Gulf Drive, but right. they, Maybe different they didn't. Could be. Yeah. Yeah. Could be. Okay. Well, I mean, if the uh, board adopts something, they either build the sign to that or they don't. So 
-hmm. I mean, so what's the what we we approve what we're comfortable with and let them do with it what they will. Yeah. Okay. That's what it sounds like his email said. Yeah. So. Well, yeah. I mean, it's I always people say that they will comply with the D, the DRB. Yes, that's true. They will. Whether they like it or not. <laughs> so okay. uh, we, we, nice of him to confirm that. Uh, we we won't <laughs> process it otherwise. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, Tim, w would you care to make a recommend? What kind of motion would give you the direction you need to move this forward? Um, is it in the minutes? So, well, some of it is. You may read off what. I mean, that's there. what I would sure. suggest, just make a motion to um, that effect. It said, uh, da, 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 da. we suggested the pale tan color, not this orangey color or peachy or whatever that is, um, would be more appropriate for the upper portion of the sign. And the top of the sign should have a shape similar to the accents on the tops of the building. Um, there are three kind of co columns that have a, a shape to the top suggested the use of stucco and then it said discussion continued i remember <coughs> i had requested that they remove that white box mm -hmm. around the sun uh, content mm -hmm. anybody else remember any of the other did you just mention the shape i think you mentioned the shape yeah the yeah, shape okay, the top yeah. to match the top of the shape the shape of the top of the building mm -hmm. accents <laughs> mm -hmm. <clears throat> that's about all i remember Dion. tim if that were in the form of a motion would you have what you need Yes, Excellent. and I've got the email in my email sent what I send him. Yeah. Um, but I think it pretty much encaps encapsulates everything you mentioned. Okay. Well, Ms. Moore, was that a motion? That was a motion. Okay. Do we have a second? Do you have everything, Karen? Second. I can read the minutes. <laughs> well, so it was pale tan instead of orange. Accents for the top of the sign. For the top of the sign. <clears throat> Accents on the top of the sign, similar to the accents on the top of the building. That has to do with the shape. The shape. The, okay, the shape so of the shape of the sign. The architectural yep. like, accents. Mm -hmm. uh, stucco for the material. And remove white the white box. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is that good enough? And Tim, if you see anything that you think would be important that we've left out that you had on your email, how does that? Or can he just pass that along? Or was there anything else, Tim? It seemed like there was something with the blue color. Yeah. There was some discussion with the blue, and off the top of my head, I can't remember what the final resolution was. But I remember I did put that in the email that I sent. I didn't. I didn't dawn on me to print it out and bring it with me. I but think the idea was is that the the sign on the can't make it as big as I thought I could. It seems like the signage on the building has a blue background rather than the. It does. I can see that from here. Because it seemed like we gave them an alternative, one or the other. Yeah, there are three colors on the building. The the background color on the building is the I believe we called it tan. Then there is a pale pinkish red that the details on the building are and that that I think our logic was a tan base red top I I'm not sure that we said we thought there was any purpose of the blue on the sign itself because it's kind of a tertiary I, th I think color I building. think you didn't like the blue on the bottom so if I recall you said on the sign itself you gave them the option of the tan or the blue well, no, it'd be the red or the blue. Yes. Yeah. But you didn't want it on the bottom. You didn't like yeah. the blue there. The bottom. We described the bottom of the sign as being tan. Yes. Yes. We did. yes. Mm -hmm. So it was either or. You could do you could do tan or blue up here, tan at the bottom. That's my recollection. Okay, I agree with that. Okay. Is more? Do you agree with that? Okay. Did we have a second? Yes. Okay. Yes. So. Okay. All right. Uh, staff, okay with what we've got? Are you good? Yes. Tim? Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. All right. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. <clears throat> Thank you, Tim. Okay, next item up, number two, is the Miramar Inn and Suites. Okay, this was also a, continued from our last meeting. At the applicant's request, 
the previous month, there was some, just, some suggestions made to provide additional landscaping, a privacy fence. I believe to the south and the west. And since then, the applicant has met with those adjacent owners and they've come to an agreement that they will provide a privacy fence along the western and southern property lines, a six foot privacy fence. And the applicant, based on the suggestions made, has also changed the color of the building because you guys wanted a, a different combination of colors. So that's the only thing that's changed since this last came before you. Didn't we discuss how they were going to hide the air conditioning and things if it's Oh, yes, top? and there, there's a note on the plan, and you're actually showing it now, right? Yeah. yeah, it's, well, he can tell you where it is on the plan, but it is actually shown. It's at the back of the building, not visible from okay. Highway 98. Hey, um, I'm Scott Jenkins with Jenkins Engineering. Thank you for letting me come here tonight. I actually was not here the first time this was heard, um, and I'd like to think that's probably why I got continued, but probably not. Um, yeah, so, but I did get passed along from staff and also uh, Tim kind of spoke in on what the concerns were, and I think initially, and I'll pass these out if I can, um, the original... Top copy is what was originally submitted, and um, and I think the, the concern was the color of the building was too dark. Um, and so after talking with the owner, um, they come back with, a, with some lighter colors. This is actually the preferred design that we would like to do if possible if you guys agree to it. Um, there's also a couple other options. Very included in here. Um, really don't like the second one very much, but uh, <laughs> you know, but you probably don't want me picking your colors. Um, but I think this one is kind of neat to what I think you guys were, were talking about. To answer this question, Tim said, and actually, I have not met in person with these agent owners. I've corresponded with email and through written letters. They requested a fence actually along the the boundary here, the southern boundary of the property, and the owners actually agreed in writing to the people to put a six foot privacy fence here. He's also going to do it all the way around the west side of the property, also. Um, the other question was associated with the air conditioning units. I think the, the utility plan in package, he's actually adjusting the building a little bit, and they're all going behind the building on the far side, away from US 98. Um, <coughs> Other than that, I think those were the main issues that, that were brought up at the last meeting. I'd also say, like the, the previous person that was uh, the previous <coughs> case that was heard before you, we'll do whatever you guys want to do too, though. So if there's something else you want to see done, I'd be happy to uh, adjust it accordingly. But I'll answer any questions. Okay, I have a quick question. The, um, the rendering that I'm looking at <coughs> on the website is a very different batch of colors than the... Oh, yes, sir. I, I just gave you those to show some other options. The first one was what y'all saw last first time, time, which you didn't okay. like. The, the second is just another option they came up with, because Tim said okay. it might be a good idea to bring some other ideas. Okay. This, the one that you're looking at online is the preferred option. Y'all's preferred. Okay, good. Okay, good. Ooh, yeah. No. Lots, lots, yeah. yeah. <laughs> 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 I think we're all... <laughs> I didn't know how that was going to... This yeah. is the preferred option. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Sorry, I don't mean to confuse this. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I was busy no, trying to. I was right. One step ahead or behind you, however, that worked out. <laughs> right. Okay, in that case, uh, and staff, just to clarify, this, this package that we're approving now is lighting, landscaping, building design, building colors, not signage. I think is that the next item? That's right, yes. Yeah. Okay. So. Aesthetics, landscaping, lighting. Okay, does uh, any member of the board have a question 
for staff or the applicant? Ms. Moore? I do, yeah, a, a few. Um, <coughs> so HVAC equipment in the back is great, but actually no rooftop equipment should be visible from 98. So I'm assuming no exhaust pipes or anything like that, satellite dishes, all that. That's correct. Okay. Um, most of my questions, I believe, revolve <coughs> around the um, landscape. Mm -hmm. um, so first of all, this shows the, the meandering sidewalk. Yes. And I assume that, you, are you guys aware that FDOT is going to we are. We had a pre-application meeting with FDOT, and they, they had the same comment. They said they're rebuilding that area um, out there, and they were going to suggest we not put a sidewalk in and provide a letter to the county basically stating that. So, because they're building one anyway. That and, makes, and it won't do that. So, yeah. yeah, and it'll be eight foot wide. And Correct. Bumped right. off the road. So, that just save you all the, your, your right. client the um, trouble and the cost. And um, also, it looks like, um, they're replacing the live oaks with crepe myrtles along the front yes. of the property. How does that work, Tim? I mean, is that a something because that... Because of overhead <coughs> power lines, there's a provision in Chapter 13 that if you are you have overhead power lines, you can do understory trees. And it, it's any understory tree in the approved list. So the overhead power lines go right through? Yeah, this, this front 100 feet, these two lines right here are the overhead power lines. Um, there's also some feeders that come back and forth. That's that main transmission line that runs along the gate. Hmm. Yeah, do you Gulf Power doesn't want anything in there. Zip, oh, not a nothing. I'm well aware. <laughs> but but our code does take into account and does allow for understory trees. And we didn't do it in this last round of changes, but I kind of think we should identify what understory trees are appropriate because you really you want something that grows out and not up because they want to keep it out of the lines. Um, and some you know trees are better at that than others. But we just identified if it's an understory tree, then you can you can use it. But if you keep them cut back, I mean crepes are are great. Yeah, and I, and I can tell you they're fine doing the the oaks or the either one, but it's just based on the power line that we change them so and the, the, the other thing that. we talked about this came up with the Hardys is that when you replace them with understory trees are you still doing the same number of both live oaks and understory trees yes. combined yes because that didn't go the right way on that one um, and my other question is this this large white space between this row of landscaping and the, and the front of the property, what's going to be in there? What well, is stormwater that? retention is actually two wet ponds that will connect <coughs> under the driveway. That'll, it's, so it's wet ponds similar to what's adjacent, actually on either side. In that area. And so it's going to be grassed? It'll be grassed at the edges and water. I mean, it, it'll actually have standing water. It'll be like a oh, lake. Oh, it'll be standing water. Yeah, like a lake, similar yeah. to the sacred heart. Is that, that going to go away when they do the widening? No. Hmm. That's interesting. Okay. Um, and then it looks like, am I right that there's supposed to be a row of hedges all the way across the front of the property? Of course, except for the entrance. <laughs> if there's vehicular parking, yes. So it's only in vehicular yeah. parking, not in front of the building? Yes. Okay. Yeah, the code says anywhere where there's vehicular use there is what it says, it has to be screened with a continuous shrub hedge. And I'm just look back to the crepe myrtles and live oaks. It just seems like these power lines are pretty far back from those tree planting areas. They are on the other side of the hundred feet. So why are, why are we doing it again? Well, well you, I think uh, you can make they a have condition, the but the, the full 100 feet is within their easement, right? It's right. Very, yeah, they have a full 100 yeah. feet, and I think the I think the re, the reason the county is requesting the change is because Gulf Power is requesting you guys to well, allow well, that well, within. Well, I think it was the applicant's choice. The code allows for it. I mean, you guys can make a condition if you want to require canopy trees, but the code allows them to use understory trees. Just for clarity, they're happy to put the other trees in. I, my understanding was they, they needed to make the change because of Gulf Power's request. But if well, you guys want to see... And that may be true, but but I didn't have any contact with Gulf Power. But, I mean, that could be yeah, true. Yeah, I've, I've spoken to Gulf Power. Um, I, they did not make a comment about the kind of trees. So, I mean, they may have to cut them, you know, trim them, do those kind of things, but. Yeah. 
Is that, I mean, that's my understanding is it's only if really the, the lines are right in where the trees are going to be planted that... Yeah, I think that's that. the intent of the code, yes. Well, I'd, I'd rather see the oaks than the crepes. My, personally, I don't know how the rest of you guys feel. Um, I, I like going to understory trees only when necessary. Just to yeah, and I know the applicant's fine with that, too, so that's just what you, you guys want to say. How do we know it's not necessary? Well, the, the actual power lines are back on this end of the 100 feet. They're side by side here. Um, where the landscape buffer is in the first 25 feet of this, closest to the roadway, and it, it, we're you know, dead 50 feet probably from any overhead power lines. So those location. oaks would never mm -hmm. get big enough to interfere with those power lines. In fact, it looks like they'll have wet ponds between them. Yeah, there'll be wet ponds in between mm -hmm. this landscaping where those power lines go. Whereas in some areas it's so narrow, the right of way is so narrow that the power lines are right within that 25 foot buffer mm -hmm. in the front. Mm -hmm. So that's where we typically would see this. It's my understanding. Yeah, yeah and, and the reason, like so we've, we've had some communication with Gulf Power already. They have a use agreement that we that the owner has to enter into to do the things in the easement. And they didn't mention anything associated with landscaping. I think we may have misunderstood when you sent the comment about being using unstory trees. We thought maybe you guys wanted to see that, but it doesn't matter. But if it if Gulf Power's not gonna cut them down, I'm fine with the oaks. Yeah, I think I just saw. Oh, and you, I, I just suggest you can use understory. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, it's whatever y'all want to see. I, I don't think Gulf Power cares as long as it doesn't interfere with the lines. That's my understanding too. That's all I have. Okay, thank you, Lee. And appreciate the color change. I think no. the new color mm -hmm. scheme is really great. Thank you. Okay, anyone else have any questions, comments, or concerns? Were the lighting, uh, lighting issues addressed? Because I, I know that when <coughs> the other gentleman was here, there were some people from the surrounding neighborhoods that were concerned about the lighting. I believe the concern was more geared toward lights from cars and things, and so the fence kind of okay. addressed that question. And, okay. And, and the buffering along that area, but yeah, I think we've met all the lighting requirements. Yeah, yeah, their photometric plan okay. is, is in compliance, but I think you're right. I think they were more concerned with headlights right. shining okay. in. Okay. I think you did, didn't though, Dave, you had some concerns about the, the brightness of the lighting around the edges of the parking lot? Yeah, I was just looking at that again. The, the, the lighting in the, on the map, I guess it's the southeast and southwest corner of the property and I think this has to do with the, the placement of the um, <clears throat> high mass lights but it I don't know if it would be possible to place the yeah um, I don't know if there's a yeah thank you yeah yeah um, and, it, um, and I'm sorry, I didn't catch what, what type of engineer you were. I'm a civil, I'm not civil guy. Yeah, okay, yeah. so, but um, I don't know if there would be an option to, to figure out a way to lay, to, to set those in a different location so that there wasn't quite, I mean, some of the, you know, just for everyone's knowledge, the lighting generally is pretty even across the parking lot um, compared to some projects, but the higher light levels are, I think this is in foot candles. Um, there's a couple around the front of the building that are up in the four and five range, but most of them are down in between one and three. And unfortunately, the southwest corner is up at 3.4, just a handful of feet from the property line. I think the code allows more than that, but... Yeah, the code allows for commercial up to 15 foot candles at the property yeah. line, which is pretty bright. 15. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I, I mean, I, I would. So I guess it's, you know, the, my, my comment is, is it's right on the edge. If there was a way to, because it's residential property adjacent, if there were a way to, um, you know, I don't know if it'd be a case of, I believe there's just, are there two or three fixtures across the top of the, or the south side of the property? I'm looking at the lighting plan, so I actually don't yeah, see the fixture yeah. locations. You know, if it were possible to have shorter lights, more of them, 
so that there's less chance that you're throwing that kind of light level into the backyard of the property adjacent because a six foot fence really does nothing except right, create right. a little shadow on the ground, right? So yeah. um, if there were a way to do something like that, I don't know that the code requires you to do that, but it would be, um, I think it would be a, a great gesture to the residential properties behind it. Yeah, I, I don't think they have a problem with that at all. Um, you know, that, that area is along that property line is pretty low usage other than just to get to the other side of the parking lot. So Yeah, and you know what I mean, you know, the, yeah, the taller right. lights are a more efficient way to light parking, but you put one extra light in and you can shorten them down a couple of feet and then suddenly they disappear to the neighbors. Right, so. yeah, I don't think that would be a problem at all, Short, either shortening or, or moving some of those lines further to the north. You know, yeah, to okay. Or both. Yeah, all right. And um, so I guess, um, I'll direct this question to you, Sydney. When we have comments like that, mm -hmm. if we capture them in the motion, is yep, that okay? that's sufficient. Yep. All right. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Can one question about yes, sir. that? Can you give me a specific foot candle you would like, and that way we can shoot for a target, maybe if it's one or okay. zero or whatever. Yeah. Whatever it is you want yep. to see at that property line. Okay. Um, Lee, you had a, a good chunk of the comments. Do you want to make a, a take a shot at a motion and? Well, you want, I don't know what foot candles. Oh, okay, I'll, I'll answer the question, yeah, okay. Totally. Um, I, I would say uh, at the southwest corner of the property, it currently shows as high as 3.4 at the edge of the parking lot. If that could be brought down to two or less. Okay. Um, and then uh, the southeast corner of the property is a little better to start with. It's at 2.35, and I'd say similarly, if it could get down to, to less than two, two that'd be okay. great. Okay. So you're ready for a motion? Anybody? Else? Ready for a motion? Uh, so motion to approve with the color scheme. How do we indicate that for her purposes? The it it would be the color scheme that's in your packet. Correct. In the packet um, for the exterior colors of the building, and using the live oaks across the 25 foot buffer instead of crepe myrtles. I think that was. And the lights. And the lighting yeah. with the lumens or foot candles around the edge of the parking lot being two or less is that right mm -hmm. on yes. the southwest mm -hmm. and southeast corner two two, two, and two foot two candles or lower. Where the, where the, yeah. yes, yes. <clears throat> Okay, so we have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you, Colleen. Colleen seconded. And any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> okay, that brings us to item three. Tim Brown. <laughs> okay, this is a, a request to allow a building sign on the rear of the building. Last month, um, actually I guess it was the March meeting, you guys approved three signs on the rear of the building with an additional deviation for height. This is a sign that's in compliance, but it's opposite of Highway 98, so it's not allowed by code. So. They're requesting a deviation to put it on the rear of the building just like they did the other three. This is Moo La La. I've already approved the one on the front through their master signage plan. So they want that same sign on the rear of the building. But in terms of technical standards, it's in compliance. And it looks exactly like the sign on the front. And this is the same building that the other signs are on? Yes, the it's rear. the end building. I don't know. <coughs> the picture of the building, I don't know how helpful it is, but it's at the very end of that building. It's and the it's, western. Already, it's already on the front. And she wants to duplicate that sign on the back side? Yes. The same size? Same size. Is that size a deviation from? Mm -hmm. No. No. No, it's, it's in compliance with, with the size. Okay. <laughs> yeah, they own, I guess, what, seven? Seven, seven units. Days. So they're going to have four, four signs for seven units. 
well, front and back. eight front Two and back. Long. Yeah, three, oh. three, one and one. So eight total front and back. So there's more to come. No. No. Why didn't the front unless they of that buy one? more units? Right now, there's no more to come. Why didn't the Moolah La one come here first before it went? It the front. Nice. They have a master signage plan. Oh, it was I approved it through the master signage plan on the front. Okay. Now, they had to get the deviation for the other three because they also wanted height. Right. Well, I, I would move to approve um, this sign on the back of the building. A second that. Okay, any further questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Uh, Tim, I did have a question about the other signs. Mm -hmm. The sign is on the building, but it doesn't look like the sign that we approved. It doesn't have the things that they refer to as the wing names or the accents or whatever. Um, and I thought that was why we approved the deviation so that they could have those that would be higher. Yes, that was for the 48 inches. That, that, mm -hmm. that was the deviation. Okay. I can go out there. I haven't been out there since they put those signs up. I can drive out there and take a look at it. Because right now, uh, what I recall seeing is just a black and white sign without any of the uh, they're they're on it. They're not there. And it just looks... Oh, yeah. it does. I don't even <laughs> notice I have not made a single comment. I, I, the next one of these that comes up, yep. I am not going to. I'm not going along with it because I, I think these signs are too big. It's a shame. It's a, it's a shame they're not here, so we can ask them. And and, and, and that's Could, they, maybe they were on special order. The Winky Dinks. I don't know. She now she hasn't indicated <laughs> anything to me, but. But there is a little bit of a disconnect because, you know, we approve a sign and they go out there and put it up, but we don't go out there to measure that, you know, we approved 20, but, you know, 28 went up or whatever, 30 went up. Because sometimes I wonder myself, is that really what we approved? I mean, it looks awfully large. This one looks really big. It the does. It's it huge. Really, to me, was conspicuous was the reason why we said it could be taller mm -hmm. is to accommodate the accents. That's right. And, mm -hmm. and they're not there. Well, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll drive out there and take a look. And I, and think, if, I think it's even in our minutes. <clears throat> we said the letters in the thrills part would be three feet. Right. And mm -hmm. then the little thingies made it a little bigger. Made it bigger. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. The, 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 the top and bottom like of the winky dinks would be 48. Mm -hmm. The letters would be 36. That was the approval. And I, I just wonder why when somebody goes out to inspect it for DO, they don't measure. I mean, and aren't there little things you can buy that measure from a distance? I mean, it's not like you'd have to climb up there and get the tape measure out. Well, in this case, the building isn't completely done. But see, normally the, the wow. building's already built when the, when the sign goes mm -hmm. up. That's not the case here. They don't have a CO yet. They're not, they haven't occupied that building yet, yeah. but typically they have. By the time you guys see the signs, that's a massive sign. Because the purpose of the having it larger was so that you could see it from Highway 98. Yeah. It about knocks you out. <laughs> you can see it. I think this. Oh the, my God. I think it's pretty apparent to me that somebody considered the, and I this comment may be better for the workshop at the end here, but I think the the folks that established the sizes that exist in the ordinance took into account the dimension off of 98 that was covered um, by this part of the code. I so I, 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 for one, will not be recommending variances again or, or, or voting for uh -huh. yeah, <clears throat> variances again. It would be like north of 20. <laughs> well, it would be outside the area that, that's subject to this requirement. I, th I, I think I the, signs are, the, 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 exist, the sizes in the ordinance are good as They're they right. are. Mm -hmm. It's good stuff. Live and learn. Okay. Yep. Um, item number four. Uh, Tom, I believe you, you're on the other side of the dais for this one. I'm officially recused. Okay. <laughs> um, yes, this is uh, Electric Cart Company building sign. Uh, it's a request for a 18 by 18 feet by three feet uh, for a total of 54 square feet sign uh, on 1.09 acres with a Future land use of VMU, um, it it's in compliance with the with the code. Code allows for 54 square feet. Mr. Applicant, if you could state your name and spell it for the record. 
Waldrop Thomas B. Jr. W A L D R O P. Thank you, sir. I brought these because there's always confusion about what color is it going to be or what have you. But this is more for the identification sign, the ground sign, as opposed to the building sign. We're on as you'll see twice, the building sign is basically taking the sign that we have now that was approved four or five years ago. It's three feet by 18 feet, 54 square feet, and mounting it where it's shown on the drawing. We are a uh, project larger than 15,000 square feet, and uh, I think the code allows us to have 100 square feet of a hundred square foot sign, but we're just asking for the 54. Okay, anybody have any questions? I think it looks nice. And is there, as in the rendering, are there two, one on each? In the rendering, side? if you look at the perspective drawings, there were two. If I choose to go there, I will come back for a deviation. So right now we're approving the one, one on, the side. Front, on the front. South elevation. Okay. <clears throat> no more questions. Okay. All right. No questions? All right. Anyone would care to make a motion? I make a motion to approve. All right. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. You're welcome. Item number five, so that was the building sign. Item number five is the monument sign. Do we need any presentation before the? Well, the only issue with the monument sign is it meets the, 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 the technical standards, but it's not what we normally call a monument style sign. A monument style sign, typically the base is as wide as the sign or wider. So. Me and the development order inspector, we, we toured the whole scenic corridor. We went from the Bay County line to the, to the Okaloosa County line. Currently, there are five signs out there like this. Three at the landing. I don't know if they did that for consistency purposes or what, but there's three at the landing, and the other two are Dollar General. Not the last one that was approved in Miramar, but the one in Santa Rosa Beach and the one just before Scenic <coughs> Gulf Drive. Every other sign out there, the sign, the base is as wide as the sign. In some cases, it's wider. It has a wider base, but not a narrower base. And you can get different interpretations if you go look on line. You know, I tried to find definitions, pictures of monument signs, but typically, it's the sign, the base is as wide as the sign. So the bottom line is, you know, has this sign been approved in the past? Yes but it's staff's opinion that this isn't a monument style sign as presented. So, you know, it's, it's, it's up to the board. In terms of size and everything like that, it's in compliance with the requirements. Can I make a comment? Sure, you're up next. Waldrop Thomas B. Jr. <laughs> um, I went and uh, Tim was nice enough to make the same comments he made to you to me before tonight. And I did fatten the base up some. Uh, but I went through and read chapter 13 again and oh what fun because it's nothing in there that says it shall be square, it shall be the same size, the base shall be equivalent to the width or shall be three inches larger or three inches narrower. Uh, there is an example. It does say, if you read the code, it says it will be no more than 12 feet tall and 12 feet wide. It will be no more than 80 square feet. And all of this fits that. The, the, the size, the way it's presented has been done at the landing. And I have one of those signs. And in my opinion, it works well to if you're going to put a 9-11 address in to give a nice texture to put that 9-11 address on, and we were going to use the same 
stucco for the main and and a metal base to reflect the same material that we have on the building, same color, both the stucco and the base. So it's not a deviation that we're asking for? I'm not asking for any deviation, no ma'am. Or as I know from my reading of the ordinance and, uh, and it just says it can be no higher, taller than 12 feet, no wider than 12 feet. It doesn't give you any more specificity than that, other than when you get into square footage and copy size. And Tom, did you, you said you widened it from what the rendering that's in our packet? No. Or this that is re That is wider than the units that are already in place at the landing, of which I have one. Um, and what is this? At the bottom of it, I just don't, I don't know, understand what it That's is. That's if you looked at, that would be the base in relationship to the top. Looking from top down? Oh, from top, top down. To bottom. Yes, That's what I needed to know. Got it. I was just trying to give you a different perspective as mm -hmm. or actually, to how I was trying to yeah. push and okay. pull that the sign. Okay. Okay, any further questions? I mean, just the comment. I think maybe the intent of, of the monument being having a base as wide or not is that it could start to look a little like a pole sign. Um, it's a little bit reminiscent, which is was the whole point of the code was to disallow pole signs in any shape, form, or fashion. Um, and if you see some pole signs, you'll know why. Um, so that's, I think if we're going to approve it like this, we need to think about at this point, whether we would want anybody and everybody to be able to build their monument signs like this, unless we decide to put some defin further definition in the code in our workshop and going forward, yeah. or attempt to anyway, it would have to be approved, but attempt to. Yeah, I understand the, the concern. I don't think this sign is even close to the point at which we have a problem with it, but I understand why staff's you know, had the concern they had. Well, but I yeah. think I think this side is on the this sign is on the right side of it. I agree. That's but my point is though. Oh yeah, what about yeah, the no, next I, one and how where, where how many? Yeah, yeah. Where do you? Yeah, so. no. I, that we we should we should put a criteria in the code that explains that the that the uh, I have to think about the language of it, but we don't end up with a post and a sign. And again, I, I don't think this one approaches that. It's just no, well, mm -hmm. a little different than the usual, but. I don't think our, the intent of the code is to make everything exactly the same, so. No. Okay, do we have anyone willing to? I'll make a motion that we approve it. Do you have a second? Okay. Motion and a second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Goodwill Home Building or Home Collection Building sign. This is a request for a 36 by 137 inch for a total of 34.25 square foot building sign. It's uh, it's on the north side of no the south side of Highway 98 near Tom Thumb in Miramar. Uh, it is in compliance with all of our regulations. So already it's already up. <laughs> no. They have they have a uh, monument sign that's okay. that's up, oh, but, they but don't have the building no, sign. there's no building okay. sign. And the monument got done. There's not administratively or. I don't think that's been approved. I don't either. I, yes. <laughs> I'm pretty confident it hasn't been approved, but. Um, Can they bring it back through, or what, I mean, or is it just a done deal? No, I don't think it's a done deal. Code enforcement just hasn't got to that but but um, I don't think it's been approved I think they just changed what was already there I and mean, I don't know what it said before but I mean you do have to get that approved if you're going to change the sign you have to get it approved yeah. okay. I thought that I saw it on the building as well you're sure it's not on there I don't believe so we I drove by there last week mm -hmm. I don't Let's think see. there's a building sign up okay. there
Okay, well, jumping back to the building sign, does anyone have any questions or concerns? Is the applicant present? Yes, sir. Yes. Would you like to come forward and introduce yourself for the record, sure. please? Yeah, thank, thank you. Good evening. My name is Bruce Screws. I'm uh, representing uh, Goodwill, and I'd like to thank this board for the opportunity. Um, I'm here representing the property owner and especially Goodwill of the Big Ben. Goodwill is seeking your approval for the wall sign in question. This Goodwill home decor sign meets the criteria of the sign code. As a matter of fact, it's actually smaller than the maximum allowed. Maximum allowed is uh, 54, 54 square feet, and the sign we're asking is 34.25 square feet. On behalf of Goodwill, please approve this final order to the sign permit application. I'll be ha happy to answer any questions, and uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Anybody have any questions? All right. Do we have anyone willing to make a motion? I'll make a motion to approve. Do we have a second? Second. All right. Properly moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> we moving into the workshop. I'm sorry. Uh, yes, sir. That brings us to the workshop. So. Okay, I sent out the draft ordinance. Now, this is draft language. It can be tweaked, but I tried to hit upon everything that was discussed in the last two workshops. And I also handed out, I guess because she wasn't going to be here tonight, Lorda sent um, some suggestions, so you have that as well. So I'll just hit on each one quickly. Um, some of it is just formatting, so it's all consistent. There on the first page, you know, it says variances, but it should say deviations to differentiate it from the ZBA. Um, on the second page, you know, I tried to put in there, like you talked about the open forum, because it does dis dis discuss that, you know, it says conceptual or preliminary reviews are encouraged. That, that was already in the code. So I add, you know, we'll have this open forum as necessary at the end of each DRB meeting. And then at the bottom, um, I added that the bulk of the regulation, lighting regulations are in Chapter 5, so I added that. Lighting ha shall conform to Chapter 5, and, and, the fo and, and the, what's below, I tried to capture what you were talking about with the parking lot lights. You gave us Kelvins. Everything else in the code is lumens, and I could not find a conversion. So I don't know oh, what uh, Kelvin yeah. is the color, color of the light. Yeah, it's different. And different. Lumens is the brightness. So yeah, you want to leave it at the Kelvins then? No, no, they're two different things. It's not, like but, your but, shirt but is. the draft here. So is this? Should this be lumens? No, 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 no. It's it. We need Just both. Just add it. Both. Add. Yeah. Because <clears throat> there is a lumen uh, in Chapter Five. There are lumen standards but I tried to capture you know, you said light fixtures should not exceed 14 feet and then if they're over 10 feet they should be set back from the property line so I tried to capture that yep um, okay um, I guess at the point we're ready to dive into lighting um, I did spend a little bit of time looking to see if there were initially I started by trying to find a another jurisdiction that had a good lighting um, section in an existing ordinance and what I discovered that seems to have had a lot of thought toward the end that we all, well maybe we all seek is the International Dark Sky Association got together with the Illuminating Engineering Society which sounds like a crazy name but the IES is actually a fairly well recognized group um, and they have drafted it was a little bit longer than I was expecting after I hit print, but um, <laughs> the, the reason for that is is that it's a, the document that, that I've distributed on the left side of the document is a user's guide, and on the right side is the actual recommended language, so it's kind of twice as long as it really is because it has this user guide built into it. Gotcha. Um, but what jumped out at me, the, con the basic concept that jumped out at me that seemed to be different um, is that 
they are, they are very, the, the writers of this were very focused on the end goal, which is a dark sky. And what I've realized is our current language is focused most heavily on having full cutoff fixtures. And so we're not sending the light directly into the night sky. What we're doing is bouncing it off everything on the ground into the night sky. And what our current code lacks is the concept of, of depending on the location, dropping the intensity of light so that we're not bouncing so much stuff into the night sky. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we could spend a lot of time trying to make our code to fix the language in our code, but I'm going to suggest, and I haven't got it nearly worked out yet, but I guess if, if, if everybody likes this concept, maybe, maybe I can meet with Tim in the next couple weeks and try to, and I, I also sent an email to the director of the Dark Sky Association to see if he's actually gone through this with somebody. I, I only sent it uh, earlier today, so I didn't have a chance to get a response or whatever. But maybe I can find a jurisdiction that, that rather than just adopting this whole thing, sort of did a distilled version and stuck it in their existing code. So anyway, yes, sir, Tom. Good question. Are, are, are we going to have some sort of conflict? Uh, and I'm going to try to paraphrase just what you said. This is a group that is interested in making the sky dark. Yes. And the people that are interested in safety they are interested this. in having light where it needs to be so we don't have accidents. Yes. And this, so this is this supported by yes. personal injury attorney here? And <laughs> no. No. But this, this, I'll go back to, this is the reason that the Illuminating Engineering Society was involved in this. They're a group of people who design lighting. Yes. So it, had, had this been just the, the Dark Sky Association and their okay. attitude been just make everything dark, I wouldn't have picked this. What, okay. what appeals to me about it is that folks with this end game in mind sat down with a group of people who design lighting and came up with a way to, and again, what jumps out at me when you read through this, what our current code lacks is we're very focused. We'll just don't do the old fashioned round globe fixtures that throw right. stuff up, but we're not taking into account. And I just use this as an example in the eight years I've lived here, I've generally lived somewhere in the vicinity of Grayton beach. I can no longer see the Milky Way. When I first moved here eight years ago, I could see the Milky Way. And since we've had these workshops, I've started paying attention. I have not seen the Milky Way once since we've started these workshops. And I've been thinking, maybe it's a seasonal thing. Maybe I'll see it tomorrow. It's gone. So we've got to do something. Um, and that's, that's what turned my attention to say, man, I need to start looking at I heard that something on NPR or whatever it's called these days is they were talking about the places in the world that, that had it. This, this is actually, these guys are actually based out of uh, Tucson, Arizona, I think. Um, and they're, you know, it's a big deal in the desert to protect, to protect that. So um, I think we need, we need to, and, and to answer your question specifically, Tom, what they talk about, um, and actually that's the reason I grabbed this, this little cover email, or not, not email, the, the website page that I uh, tacked in the smaller packet. It talks about, they have the five lighting zones they try to limit the amount of light. It's not just not throwing it in the sky because whatever you throw it on is gonna bounce it up in the sky. Um, but the, the concept for safety is that if you provide extremely bright light in one location, the way the human eyeball works, the dark around it looks darker. Mm -hmm. And the, just the example is when you drive up, if you're driving in a rural area, you drive up on a service station, it is black around that bright spot. The book, you know, all the crazy people in the world could be hiding in those shadows and you pull in and they'll all jump out or whatever, if that's what you're worried about. Um, and uh, if you just had a lower, even level of light, you'd still be able to see what was going on in the dark spot. And I know this because I, I work and live in places like Grayton and Rosemary and Seaside. And yeah, but when I, you have and outdoor cameras and you want to find out who it is that's walking in your front yard, you want the light to be bright enough to capture yeah. that person. And, and Donna, I will say this. <laughs> Your right to see who's in your front yard is not better than my right to see the night sky. <laughs> oh, I so, disagree with you there. Nope. 
I'm absolutely. No, I do just, disagree with you. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yes, I do. <laughs> yeah. You don't have statistics. I mean, how many people have been attacked in their front yard in, in this area? Well, I can show you some stuff right now about my, my front yard as of Saturday night. Okay. Well, well, you know, I, 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 I guess what I'm saying is that, that the attitude that more light is safer is wrong because the brighter cities in this country are not safer than where we live. That's right. Well, they always say that, like, if park under a bright light if you're going to go to the grocery store or something. Park under a bright light so you, you're not walking into a dark place, you know. In a, so you in walk out area. of a bright spot into a dark spot. I don't know. I'm just. Well, and I think you can achieve both. I really do. That's that's what I mean, this group is. That's what this group is saying here this, today. And another yeah. thing, you know, this has come up. This came up in the destination improvement committee with TDC that I'm on because we were looking at the possibility of lighting the bridges on 38, the pathways. Uh, pedestrian paths over the bridges mm -hmm. and <clears throat> it came up and I totally get this and agree that say a cyclist is driving is riding down the path and it's dark if they go through a lighted area when they go in, back into the dark their eyes have to adjust mm -hmm. and it creates a safety hazard mm -hmm. so that's the last thing we want to do is create other unintended safety hazards by lighting mm -hmm. a place it's just like I've told you when I drive past that Publix my visibility of the road is negatively impacted, the road in front of me, because of all the light pouring off of that. Yeah, these are so, facts. So, yeah. These are, I, these are inarguable facts. And, and again, I was going to say one more time, the reason I grabbed this one is because it's not just a group of dark sky hippies. They yeah. went out and found a group of engineers who was willing to work with them to try to come up with a code that was thoughtfully written. They address safety right off the bat in their code. Yeah. They are very concerned with it. You can achieve and, and I want to, I've been thinking about this for a long time. The reason that I mentioned the Kelvins is, is an example for cameras and things like that. It's very well recognized if you use an extremely blue light, which 6,000 Kelvin and above are, you will see a person at night wearing a shirt like Tim's and think it's blue. It will change the colors of people's clothing. And the police departments in cities have figured this out and they're now advocating to get away from the very blue lighting the high and, and extreme or extremely yellow lighting and get to a more natural daylight spectrum because in the event that there is a crime and they're trying to find out what did the perpetrator look like oh, that, they need an accurate description absolutely. of what they were wearing yes and if you i mean if you don't believe this happens just next time you're under an extremely blue um, well, light to check it out colors. yeah no the colors get very very dis difficult to distinguish so I think that we just need we need to get more sophisticated and again it was it was after we started these workshops and I thought to myself well, you know you know how, how well are we doing do we really need to worry about that much and when I started thinking about what I could see in the sky I remember I remember a person in the street uh, this was four or five years ago while I was walking down Pine Street in Graydon and um, they stopped me. it was about three years ago actually they stopped me and uh, they asked me what they thought was a, cl like a cloud they're like what is that in the in the sky and I looked up for a second and I'm like that's the Milky Way and so I know that I used to see it all the time and it's gone now you can't and it, it is it's one of the things that I don't, they don't mention it in here but I'm sure it's one of the criteria you use as to how much light pollution you have is whether you can see that or not it's a uh, anyway so I don't want to sound too dramatic or worked up but I just I really do feel strongly that we need to we need to step this up I think the concern about safety is very very important but you know I don't think, I think if one day, if a few years from now, we're sitting here talking about, you know, the fact that our night sky is just a big yellow haze like it is in a lot of developed areas, the character of this place is going to change. People are not going to feel like they're out, you know, in yeah, some yeah, I, I don't experience what you do because I guess where I live, when I go out in my backyard and I can look at the sky and I, yeah, it's beautiful. I don't have those issues. Yeah. You know, so. I can't because you know. I'm on the water. And Right, right. Yeah, on the north side? It's different. I'm on the east end of the bay. Yeah. Yeah, that's... But on the... Yeah, on the bay. Yeah. Well, on the... And I see everything in the sky. Yeah. Towards, you're looking over North Walton. What, what I'm, I'm looking due west. Okay. So... Yeah. So, anyway, I'm, I'm just telling you, what I see when I turn and look due west now is the glow of Miramar. Sure. So. David, are you thinking that you, um, I guess if we went forward with the model ordinance, that that's something that you would want to see if the BCC would consider in Chapter 5? Or if you just... Oh, um, my, my point, what my intention was today was to introduce the, 
this ordinance, um, I've, I've sent an email to the executive director of the Dark Sky Association with the hope that I could talk to him. I described what Walton County was like. I described what this board is and, and what it is we're trying to do. And my hope would be is, is that he could give us the name of a jurisdiction that has gone through this process. This was written in 2011. I see where you're going, Sydney, because that's the first thing I thought was, yeah, shouldn't this really be for all of wherever, Walton County? Oh, I'm um, sorry. I misunderstood. Oh, I thought yeah, you meant, sorry. was, was yeah, I going to try to ram this thing down the no, BCC's no, no, throat? No. <laughs> no, my intention was to try to, I mean, if we could if we could consider adopting it as a standalone okay. ordinance, that'd be fantastic for the whole county. That'd be great. I don't, my intention is not to limit it. My, because it's it, what happens in Freeport is going to affect the night sky and, and other way around. Right. My suggestion would be to go for it for Chapter 13. And then potentially go for it because I I think in this limited area, first of all, on this corridor we have a concentration of of commercial developments and, putting off a lot of light. Yep. Um, but I also think it would be a much longer and harder task to get overall county buy-in and approval. Um, so I would suggest we start here because this is where the real need is at the moment. But you know, you could be looking 20 years down the road with Defuniag and Freeport having the same problem. Yeah. But just today, I, I don't think it's okay. as big of a need. But but I would suggest that we we try. We're having the workshops. We're already in a mode of amending Chapter 13, so we try to get it into Chapter 13, and then maybe suggest broader application mm -hmm. once it's in Chapter 13. Okay. That's just my preference. And I would say too that I think we should hold off judgment because I think your needs probably could still be satisfied of safety and everyone else's. You stated a specific right, one right. and still do most or all of this. It's more about, I mean, I don't think of it as much about it. Safety lights on homes do affect it when you add a whole bunch together. Mm -hmm. But we've got other things I think that are mostly driving this right now. And I bet those safety issues could still be achieved. If and get some of this way, in place. If there's a way to, to make it to where it's not like these bright lights here and to make it something more subtle, you know. I'm, and that's the I'm, even, yeah, right. the even level of light. Right. That's, yes. that's absolutely. And I, I work with a lighting engineer in Seaside. We had a complaint. We had a complaint from cyclists that they couldn't see riding down the bike path at night through Seaside. And we had a complaint from pedestrians that bicyclists were coming out of the light, out of the dark, at them. And they felt like they were constantly jumping out of the way. And of course, Motorists sitting at the at the streets in Seaside trying to pull out would start to pull out and have to stop because a cyclist would come out of the dark. So yeah. I, I hired a lighting engineer and rather than increase the amount of light in the existing fixtures, we left those and we added an identical fixture half the distance to the next fixture. Mm -hmm. And you can you all can drive through it and see problem. it now. Mm -hmm. It um uh it, it just it just made it a, an even level of light, got rid of the right. dark spots was right. the goal. Right. And no, not not no brighter light than's ever been in Seaside, and it works much much better. So why don't we just go to red lights? That's what like, we do on the boat. Yeah. You know, on my lot, if I'm on oh, the yeah, bridge yeah, yeah, yeah. and I'm running at night and I need to, yeah, I've got oh, red yeah. lights. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Turtle not blue lights. Mm -hmm. yeah. Turtle light too. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. They are. I'm thinking of the amber lights. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, that's, that's effectively that's a red a red wavelength. Right. So yeah. So anyway, I, um, so you think that you maybe could work with staff to get this home down and into a? Yeah, I mean, I think it's going to take a little bit. I don't know if we just in, in, if we're if we're moving along through these workshops, if we do one of the old deals where we put, you know, some placeholder um, so that we don't lose the thought, uh, and then later on, um, you know, maybe I can. I, what, what I'd love to do would be to get the dark sky folks. They have these teams that travel around the country to go places and, and try to work things out. Turtle lighting is one of the things that they've worked on. Mm -hmm. um, so they, I, I may discover that they have some point of contact not far from here or somewhere in the state of Florida that we could work with. Quite possibly. Um, but again, what really, what really appealed to me about the group was is that they had the end goal in mind, but they involved engineers. And so I think we're, it's likely to be a, a real mm -hmm. solution. And they did mention <clears throat> safety very early yeah, on in the discussion yeah. yeah and I didn't that's mean to make my, my intention of my comment was just to, re, to restate it was not that safety is less important than this it just I think we have to treat it as equally important yeah. because it's gonna we're gonna lose one of the very special things about this area if we don't 
I think it's I mean, really I understand. Important. Yeah. I understand what you're saying. I think it's really important that we get down in writing. So whoever is out there planning a building or a project knows what they're fixing to come up against when they get here. Yeah. Not springing on them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, yeah. And and heretofore, there's nothing really. This board has been very good about paying attention, thanks to David's interest in lighting. I mean, he's focused on that and paid attention to it. So I, I think, you know, to this board's credit, we've been consistent with that. You know, don't share your light with your neighbor, basically. But I think it needs to be reduced to words mm -hmm. so that people that, whether they're civil engineers or architects or whatever, safety engineers can see the words and respond accordingly before they get here and you are you or uh, we have to educate them mm -hmm. i don't think that's our responsibility well this is but great information work on there, right well, absolutely yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I i i you know tom and maybe to your point is is we can't just tack this correct thing onto our code because it's it needs to be incorporated into the whole spirit of the deal. Yeah, absolutely. Um, another question I have is I wonder, <coughs> and I don't know if you've gone through this in depth enough to even know the answer to this question, but I wonder if there are a few like major points we could incorporate now that are similar to what's here. You know, it's just a, basically <coughs> a sentence or two. Um, in addition to that, on the brightness side, this is the color side, right? The terrace yes, here, yeah. um, and and there's a height. I wonder if there are some basic primary things that we could get in this series of changes, such that we're not holding up the entire mm -hmm. amendment process that we're going through now while we're getting because this is pretty complex. It looks like it's actually not terrible when I'm looking at it. These are tiny, so it's not like it's a ton of. Yeah. But it's it's pretty complex, and we may, it, or may it not just a, it's just it's a completely different concept of how to deal with the issue mm -hmm. than than simply saying "Thou shalt not point your light fixtures into the sky." That's I mean that's which is why I think it also might have broader application than just the corridor. Yeah, I agree. Um, but okay. Well, uh, how, uh, how many more work is this? This is three. This is three, and we were approved for three, but I can ask the BCC for additional ones. That won't be a problem. Okay. So we can have more. My um, thought was just if we think we're close on everything else, and this is going to take us six more months, yeah. realistically, or how, but it may not. Maybe in the next month or two, y'all can hash through this and talk to these people and get it done. I'm just yep. trying to be. Would it be a good idea, I guess, you know, if this is the main thing that we're waiting on, maybe not have a workshop in June and wait until July, and that'll give David a little bit more time to. Do some research, and I, this is just an idea. We can certainly have another yeah. workshop in June, but yeah. his staff definitely needs to get involved too. With David, yeah. I think this is pretty complicated. But obviously, June and July are probably busy times of year for you. So yeah, I mean, mostly, mostly what I'm doing is pinging on um, uh, this organization to try to, you know, get an answer. I mean, his, the answer may come back that no, we've been through this before. What you need to do is adopt this ordinance. <laughs> in which case. Uh, well, no, but I'd be surprised if that's the case. They, again, this is this document's been around since 2011, so my guess is, is that there's probably dozens of places that have. And it's meant to be broadly applicable. Yeah, because it's a model. Is the just as a point of information is the calculation when they do the photometric study, the calculation that is rendered as the brightness of something. Is that lumens per square foot? How is that? There, um, as an example, the project we had tonight had two charts in it. The first one was, it's, it's, they were in foot candles, and the first chart was foot candles on the surface of the parking lot, and the second one was foot candles 18 inches off the surface of the parking lot. And you can see when you look at those, it's dramatically different numbers. Um, but I, I think the challenge we have is that when a parking lot fills up with vehicles, they've got windshields and there's white cars and there's different colored cars and the reality is is that all that light is bouncing off of the things that it's being shined on mm -hmm. and that's that's why when the chart shows that you know at the surface of the ground it looks like the foot candles drop off to almost nothing at the property line but when you live next to one of these places 
it doesn't it doesn't feel like that, mm -hmm. and that's what I think this this code um, uh, addresses. And again, it's it's not so much saying that you know if if you happen to if you happen to have a you know a, a, a service station next door, you know there's certain safety criteria that says you need it lit a certain way. I think there's a component of the the lobby for filling stations tends to make everybody think that it has to be way brighter than it does, but I mean, that's, they, that's what they've done. Um, I, I, I think that this, this is really very focused on the big picture of not having light pollution in a community like ours that has a few corridors in it that generate a lot of light that, that have impact, you know, miles away. I think this is really focused on trying to localize um, that. So, you know, the Highway 98 corridor, it's going to be Right, but hopefully it's not generating so much stray light that it makes Great Beach also bright, which is the, the effect it's having. Well, the code the, generally is in foot candles. When you get into the floodlights and whatnot, it talks lumens, but like yeah, the measurement at the property line is in foot candles. Lumens yeah. is how you measure how much a fixture puts out. Yeah. Yeah, like that's a, the power of a light bulb is 60 watt versus a 100 watt bulb. Yeah, yeah. but depending so, on type of foot, foot candles is has, I mean, it's obviously driven by the fixture, but it's a measurement of light away from the fixture. So, so. The, the foot candles today are really are, are really um, uh, outlined in chapter uh, five. Chapter five. Mm -hmm. So what what are what is that in a nutshell? Do you know for say parking lots or buildings or what are the maximums? Uh, it says the maximum light level should be ten maintained foot candle at any property line in a residential area or on a lot occupied by a dwelling, congregate care, or congregate living structure, and fifteen maintained foot candles at any public right of way. So I said earlier fifteen at the property line, but it would be 10, because that's, that's a residential area. If I'm not mistaken, yeah. that's we quite were bright. shooting on my project, we were shooting for somewhere around one at the property line, mm -hmm. because David made a comment that one foot candle could be seen at what? It's a human feet or something? No, no, at, at, actually, this is a, a, the way I read this is an indication of sensitivity to the human eye. If, if, it was, if there were no other light sources, a human eyeball can see one foot candle one mile away. Yeah, that was, yeah. yeah so 10 so is quite 10 bright. Is really, 10, really 10 bright. is quite bright. I mean, so 10 I is like a football nice stadium well, at well, night. Well, yeah, and here's, here, here's the, just to boil it down, if you go to page 26 in the user, or in, the, in the document, the bigger document I handed out, they have what's called, and this is fun, the bug rating. And it explains, if you look at the user guide on the left side, it explains what the bug rating is. And, you know, as an example, it says, as is a relatively new rating system, many people may not, may not be familiar with it, they have to provide more of an explanation. Um, but what they recognize is the old terms of trying to do everything with foot candles or uh, lumens is inadequate to deal with the problem. I mean, the, the code, the existing codes we have prove it. Walton County, it's not like Walton County doesn't have regulation of lighting. We do have regulation of lighting. What I'm trying to say tonight is, is that it's, it's, it is a conventional way of trying to control light and it's not working. We have, There's another one. We have a huge portion of South Walton that is forest and we're still starting to see the signs of light pollution that is going to render the night sky invisible. So we got to do something differently. And, I, and, and we're adding I, light to that. Like yeah, I mean, just tonight hourly. we've approved another project that is going to add a significant amount of light to the night sky. Totally. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, and, and we were doing everything we could to work with the code we have. But the reality is, is that yeah. those, when you have few fairly powerful fixtures, even though they're full cut off, Yep. You're still you're still, still affecting the night sky. You're still right. affecting the roadway uh, a couple hundred feet away, you know. And then the roadway lights have to get brighter because the parking lot lighting is so bright because of the effect you mentioned that your eye, it has on your eyeballs. And so it just starts mm -hmm. this race to everything gets brighter and brighter and brighter. Yes. Yeah. You try to compensate with other light and then yeah. other light and then other light. Yeah. And they talk about the the G in the in the bug is glare. 
And so, mm -hmm. um, you know, our current code doesn't deal with, with glare. I mean, just like sitting in this room, those are noxious light fixtures. Well, they what are. you what what you call that is glare. They bother me. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay, I can feel my own tone getting kind of so, um, uptight, so I'm gonna shut up. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm getting, I'm getting off my soapbox. This stuff is important. I get a little granola for just a moment. But <laughs> it's interesting that this is happening to me now, and this is applicable to this discussion potentially. Like I have, I've had a development, a new development in my life, which is so unwelcome that my circadian rhythm has flipped, and so I am more awake at night than in the day. That is not good. Let me tell you, <laughs> if you've ever had that problem. So I've been researching it, and one of the things that can contribute to it or cause it is excess exposure to light late in the evening. So these things can actually affect health in the human body in more ways than just one. Um, and so, and if you've ever tried to darken your bedroom, like truly darken it, you'll realize how very, very difficult that is unless you live out in the country away from anything. There's a lot more light out there than we realize. I mean, I, I you basically just have to put up cardboard covered tin tinfoil over your whole entire window openings if you really want to darken your room. So, um, so yeah, it's, I think it's a very important thing. Um, realistically, David, how quickly do you think we could come up with a version of this that we could even assess yeah. and see if we want to move forward with something like this in its full glory? Um, well, I assuming I get the chance to have the exchange with the guys with the Dark Sky Association, and I'm going to keep my fingers crossed that they can say, "Here's an in, here's a jurisdiction that adopted that you that, did, that went through what you've gone through, mm -hmm. and kind of shorten things." I would hope that I, if if we don't do it next month, but the following month, between now and next month, I'll try to get work with staff so that we can get something out for everybody to review. So can that, you get a sample? I mean, can you get a light that we could actually see what you're talking about? Um, that's a good question. I mean, I bet they do. Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't know that it's 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 saying that we have to use fewer fixtures. I mean, I, well, I'll, I'll use. I mean, like my the understanding colors of colors and right. Yeah. Levels right. Of yeah. Brightness. Well, I mean, the, the easy example is is that one of the things that's that's um, um, uh, if you think about the old what we now I guess we call old fashioned the regular old sixty watt incandescent light bulb that you used to go buy at the store. But, you know, it, before they basically became illegal to manufacture. Um, they are illegal to manufacture now. Mm -hmm. um, uh, those put off a very kind of warm, uh, it, it just feels like a really normal, nice light. Mm -hmm. um, these lights, as an example, and actually you can see that there's, it looks like there's some different, different yeah. yeah. Different bulbs in them. The yeah, ones near the, the door, yeah, are more yellowy looking. Mm -hmm. Those are a lower Kelvin. Um, those are probably still over 3,000 Kelvin. The one in the back there is probably closer to 5,000 Kelvin. It's noticeably bluer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, these these lights over our head, these are uh, those are they look like halogen lights, and they're pretty warm. Those are probably, Tom, you might judge too. Those are probably around 3,500, 2,500 somewhere in yeah, there. Generally, they have you know, yeah. mid mid threes up yeah. to four for halogen. And yeah. they, well, those I mean, used to be our white lights before we got LEDs. Yeah. Allergen was as pure a light as you could find. Yeah, they were what they called daylight. And I got into too much research on this new building, but like when you get into colors and, I, you know, automobile showrooms, yeah. 5,000. Yeah, everything pops, the chrome looks shinier. 5,000. Yeah. When no. you get to safety, service technicians working and all that. To be able to see what they're doing. 5,000. When you go into your office, 4,000. 5,000 is too bright. Mm -hmm. I re and I reckon it has to do with like maybe having white paper or, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I'll right. tell you, yes, no this, you can do much. this at the grocery <laughs> store and you guys are gonna hate me for this. But um, next time you take some meat, if you eat meat, just do it for fun. Take it out of the display case that the meat's in and walk across the aisle and look at the meat and you will go Ooh. <laughs> because you will walk out from under the blue light that makes it look very red yeah. into redder light that makes it look like what it actually looks like and it's not pleasant um, so you know it's this, these different colors of light are all around us um, and 
the, the, the biggest thing that I think that, that this code proposes is, is that, that the, the concept of a, a light mounted on top of a 20-foot pole lighting a quarter of an acre mm -hmm. requires so much light out of that one fixture that the stuff that's underneath it, it, the, the, it is going to bounce light off of it all over the place. Mm -hmm. and, and again, uh, I don't mention Seaside as an example because I have anything to do with Seaside. It's just that it, it, they are normal little, little light fixtures mounted 10 feet off the ground and there's lots and lots and lots of them and it makes a very general, you know, a very even level of light. Now there are areas in places like Seaside and Rosemary Beach that don't have enough light. Um, so, so I'm not using those as great examples. They are underlit. Um, but uh, mm -hmm. the other end of the spectrum is, you know, they're not picking on Miramar, it just happens to be that's where all the high mass lighting is. And if, if you look at it, you're gonna, you'll notice that even though if they meet our code, there's still a lot of stray light coming off those properties, and that's what we've got to get rid of. It's not you're saying more, but lower. More, more light, or, yeah, they can be more fixtures, lower levels of light, more of them, mm -hmm. and that's a more even level of light, and that way you don't have a bright spot that's bouncing light all over the place. That's the general concept. Mm -hmm. and, you, and when you get more lower light levels that are shielded better, you don't end up with these glare type things. Right. And I, I, can, I think we just can, can overreact when safety is concerned. An example like that we're dealing now with um, the, the intersection of 30A and 90A down in Inlet Beach on the, mm -hmm. on the east end. It's not lit at all. And so there are some tremendous safety hazards there. Mm -hmm. And I, I almost was a casualty of one because I, there was a car overturned on its side perpendicular with, in the lane, the travel lane that I was traveling in, and I literally could not see it until I got right up on it. I was looking at the underside of the car, which was black, it was an SUV, and the only reason I saw it is there were a few guys that were involved in the accident on the side of the road waving their cell phones. And when I looked over at them, I realized there was something going on and I slowed down, and otherwise I would plow, I mean, I could not, I had no idea that vehicle was there. So anyway, that's the story, but the point is, that FDOT is doing a safety study of that intersection. But I told them, please don't light it up like a ball field. Right. You know, right. because the, right. the reaction is, oh my God, we've got to really light that because somebody's going to die there. But it won't you take a whole see. ton of light, right? I just, you, people, drivers just, and pedestrians and whatnot just need to be able to see. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, that's yeah. some of what we, we experience. And then businesses, you know, everybody wants everybody to see their business and safe parking lots and all that. But I think it kind of goes beyond, unless there's a, like a reason, like you said, like doing work and you need to see, or vehicles you need to see in a showroom. So um, I think there's a good happy medium. So it has to, the colors of light, the amount, of, the, the number of fixtures, the intensity of the light, which direction it's pointing, all that. They, they have five different. It's a different section. I'm not, I don't know this thing back and forth yet. But there's another. Well, actually, it is in this chart, the same page I mentioned. So there's there's different areas you read across this little chart. Reading down the chart, they have five different lighting zones, zero, one, two, three, and four. Mm -hmm. And those different zones would be applied to different, you know, areas, neighborhoods, or different uses and things like that. And so they acknowledge, hey, some some uses need more light than others. Mm -hmm. And the last thing I'm going to mention about it has to do with something I noticed. Um, Tim, I sent you an email. The um, um, Los Rancheros. Los Rancheros, yeah. They've mounted a bunch of, of uh, spotlights. Actually, today I drove by to drop some mail off, and they got some other new ones up. Um, I don't know what it is about that particular owner, but they are just mounting light after light after light, that none of which are compliant. they got them mounted on trees and all kinds of stuff. They're just lighting up the, the front of the building in the parking lot. And so that is just, there's pr we could probably make some great strides if we would, you know, code enforcement had the ability, and I understand problem is code enforcement doesn't work at night so lighting is not one of the things that they look at but we well, one of the things to... they've they've done is work with the owner to send pictures at night that's been yeah. working for them since they don't work at night they get so that I mean the owner has to cooperate of course but they've had success with that they'll send pictures they can examine what it looks like at night and make a determination okay mm -hmm. so if we see problems take a picture at night and send it to That'd be helpful, that, okay. absolutely. Right. <laughs> I've got one example, I guess, of how <laughs> people don't understand lighting. When I was in Santa Rosa County, there was a lawsuit against Walmart. Walmart, the lighting, the light, the parking lot lights were fairly spread out, so you had kind of dead spots in the middle. Well, this lady had parked between the lights, and she got attacked. 
So she, she sued Walmart for negligence, and the judge ruled in her favor, and you know, the code said the light had to be pointed down. So the, the judge ordered that those um, whatever be removed. Well, he didn't understand. All that does now is diffuse the light. Mm -hmm. yeah. So mm -hmm. there's a residential neighborhood right next to Walmart, had no issues, no problems when it was shielded. When the shields came off, all that light started spilling over into that neighborhood. And they called all the time saying, this light's coming into my living room, or this light's coming into my bedroom. And of course, we had to say, we can't do anything. It was a, it was a, it was a, it was a court case, and the judge ruled that those shields, but in my mind, that just showed he didn't understand how lighting worked, because it didn't make it safer. It just diffused that light. But if he would have put more up. And yeah, the, the yeah because they were so fine. spaced yeah. apart, you had dead areas, right. and she mm -hmm. just happened to park. You know, she didn't park right under the light, and she got, unfortunately, she got attacked. But that was not the solution to the problem. That's what yeah. happened, but that wasn't the solution. No, a judge shouldn't engineer lighting solutions. No. Okay. Okay, so um, I, I'm good with the, the concept for this piece of the workshop. If um, I guess if we do we need to try to walk out here today, Sydney, with whatever we're going to adopt with the portions that we have? No, no, okay. I think the idea is we'll ask the BCC to hold more workshops. Okay. Don't you think? Yeah. Okay. Do you yeah. want me to continue with the proposed changes or? Yeah. yeah. Yep. Okay, on I the next page, lighting up. page four, <laughs> I just added back in chapter seven because it just, you know, it just said in and it ended right there. I put uh, where you can have two flags, the U.S. flag and the state of Florida on one flagpole. I mean, I thought that captured you guys didn't like where you could approve a third flag. You have two flags, period. If you want to come in for a deviation, you come in for a deviation. Then on page five, Lourdes had a couple suggestions with real estate. She talked about it has to be removed immediately after it sells, but I mean, how are we going to know when it sells? Huh? Well, okay. I mean, I get where she's coming from. Don't leave it up there forever. But you know, a lot of times you have 30, 45 day closing dates. Mm -hmm. um, but I so, think at least it guides the applicant or the person putting up the sign. I'm sorry? I think at least it guides the sign, the person putting up the sign to know to take it down. Okay, I mean, you want, if you want me to add that, I will. That's, oh, that's her I mean, suggestion. That's, that's just my opinion. Well, kind of in self-contained. If it's sold, actively you're no longer actively sell. attempting, they no longer have the justification for the temporary sign. That's right. Mm -hmm. So I think it's already in there. Okay. That just states it more clearly. Or states so what it you're again. saying is if there's a sign up there and it says sold or under contract, it doesn't need to be there, the sign? Mm. I mean, from a real estate broker standpoint, I'd argue against that, and I'm sure Donna would too, mm -hmm. because just because it says sold doesn't make it mean, I, I think it's, it's more still of for sale closed. until it closes. I think right. it's mm -hmm. more of um, a lot of times signage. I see this all the time on 98. Signage just gets left. Mm -hmm. And not until whoever bought that property finally comes out to build on it, they'll take it down. And that we just don't mm -hmm. need that additional clutter out there. So maybe the actively attempting to sell is not the right phrase. Maybe it's well, if you're um, no longer actively attempting to once it's closed or once it's yeah upon closing or something. That way, if they want to have the under contract out there. Well, there's like there's like the language that, that covers political signs. They got there's yeah. I think they've three think days they've, after the I election, and then if there's a runoff, you're allowed to leave it up or something. I mean, it's pretty. Well, we allow, so two allow weeks three. after closing. I think it's uh, three or fourteen. Well, you can put your sold sign up for right. a little bit. Yeah. There is right. a time. <laughs> <laughs> you have your sold yeah. sign up. Before, a long time before you close. Yeah. So we could put something yeah. like ten, no more than Hopefully. ten days after the close, or seven days after the close, something like that. Whatever. But yeah, yeah. yeah. Two weeks. I'll, I'll pick on. Sorry, Donna. Mm -hmm. you, you can <laughs> smack me anytime that's you want it. to. But I mean, I think that's an, see, when when the when the sign is up and there's an active attempt to sell the property, the sign is up for the purpose of selling the property. The reality is, is when the sold side goes on it, the sign is now being used to advertise that realtor services. 
But Mike's point is it's not sold until, until it closes. I understand right. that. Because the contract could get fall, yeah. through. fall through. Yeah. So but that's that. not what the sign says. I agree. So that's just. <laughs> I, they don't put up a lot of sold out, out, out on there. They do a lot of pending. Uh, is there a lot of solds out there? Yeah. I don't see a whole yeah. lot of sold sometimes, but not much. But I think it's more of just sometimes those signs just get left least, out. I think Lee's point is, is that the sign right. that, I mean, there's a commercial properties, large, large commercial prop parcels this happens very frequently yes a four by eight sign goes up it looks freshly painted it's straight it's nice the property sells the sign sits there it fades one of the posts rots the county crew comes by and redigs the culvert and it gets knocked over and i'm, I'm describing a sign that's on 393 that i've watched yeah. a guy that i know from pensacola uh, john s car company the company actually changed uh, uh i think berkshire hathaway bought them a Berkshire Hathaway sign with the same realtor's name went up about 50 feet down the road, and the old sign is still sitting there with one post broken. Yeah. That old sign should have come down a long time ago. I imagine that's what Lourdes was thinking about. Yeah. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not that concerned about a week or a, two weeks or a day or whatever but it's after selling, but it's the just kind of like immediately after, after closing. After. And then just that reasonable. That's kind of time. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah. Big years, so we didn't. That's what I said. Days. You've got to give a time. 14 days. Mm -hmm. I'd say. If I could um, speak for just a moment, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Uh, we also have to think about the enforceability of this. Absolutely. Now, Absolutely. how do we know when a, when a property sale closes? Unless we're plugged into MLS or we know the people, we don't know. Uh, and I, don't, uh, I would not want to suggest that we have our code officers sitting on MLS looking for signs that are properties that have sold so they can go out and look at the signs. Now. I certainly agree with they need to come down when their purpose is ended. Yeah. Throughout Chapter 7, 15 days is the standard for removal of political signs after an election, okay. uh, for removal of temporary signs not requiring a permit, and several other cases. So we've already got a standard um, to apply. Um, we need more effective code enforcement. Yeah, and I right. think you want right. to, to keep it as, as so long as they're attempting to sell it because instead of putting something saying it comes down 15 days after it closes because, you know, it may not close, but they may not be actively attempting to sell it anymore. You know, it, it oh, may be true. a situation take it off the market. The market. Yeah. yeah. And, I, and I don't think it fundamentally matters for the purpose of the code that there are well-maintained temporary signs up. But I think Lourdes was describing the same thing that I was concerned about, which is there are signs that are not well maintained that are up simply because nobody took them down. I agree. If code enforcement goes to one of those properties, contacts the owner and says, hey, you know, and I'm picking on my old buddy John S. Carr, you got all these broken down signs on the property, and, and he says, well, I'm still actively trying to sell it. Code enforcement would say, great, remove the dilapidated sign, put up a nice well, one. And we'll we, take the old one down. We do have a standard for those temporary signs, yeah. not requiring a permit. There's an actual diagram. It's supposed to have a wooden white frame on it, and we've yeah. had some of us that have sort of gotten away from that in the marketplace. Yeah. Uh, I mean, is, is, that, is that fair to say that we're not so much concerned with the, the well-maintained signs that meet all the criteria as we are the... That's most the clearly of clearly dilapidated old sign. That's most of it. But when you're riding down the corridor and it's just sign after sign after sign, and say 10% of those or 20% really shouldn't even be out there anymore, at that point I stop caring whether it's well maintained or not. Yeah. Right. And, and I think, too, Mac, I'm not arguing. That, that would be very difficult to enforce, and I don't expect code enforcement officers to sit on MLS. But I think um, enforceability should only impact regulation and law making not completely drive it because and why i say this is if i'm driving that corridor and i start seeing a sign out there now i haven't gotten to this point yet but i think i might <laughs> out there forever and ever and ever and ever and ever i might some joe citizen might just go check the mls and see if that thing really is for sale and a certain number of people are going to comply with the code voluntarily they're just going to follow the law because it's the law so I, I don't think it hurts, even though you know that you can't enforce a code 100%, because no, I would not want code enforcement officers sitting on MLS going through all those properties. That would take a lot of time that they could be out enforcing codes. Um, but I think it does help to put things in 
Well, and I agree. I mean, sometimes having those standards in the code sort of allows people to self-regulate. And we mm -hmm. want as much of that self-regulating as possible built into our, our system. Um, it, it certainly makes code enforcement much more efficient because ideally there's less to enforce. Right. Um, but at the same time, let's try to be reasonable about because if we got some in the code and we're not actively out there enforcing it, we're going to get complaints from the public. Um, and if it's not enforceable uh, in the way that it's written, then that's problematic. Um, we have a circumstance where code enforcement can't do their job as the public perceives what their job is. Um, but if we can put things in there that helps people comply with the law uh, without us having to hammer them, um, I think that would move us a long way where everybody here is trying to get. Um, but there are a number of signs out there that are old, dilapidated, that shouldn't be there. Maybe um, we could address I don't that. think we need to change the code to deal with that. Uh, we had right. a meeting with code enforcement this afternoon on scenic quarters, and we covered a whole, we covered your whole list. Uh, and thank you very much for the, the shotgunning of all of those things that, that you could think of at that time. And, and there are more of those out there, as, as we all know. Yep. Um, but that gave us a start. Um, and one of the things we're going to focus on um, are the things that are very, very clear, and that are number of real estate signs, size of real estate signs, number allowed per size of that particular mm -hmm. property. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and where we have two signs mounted at a 90 degree angle, that counts as two signs. If they're within three feet of each other, it counts as one sign. A real estate community, or at least our sign installers don't understand that mm -hmm. because that is everywhere. Mm -hmm. Our code enforcement didn't understand that until today. So we're going to be working very hard internally to make sure the code enforcement officers understand exactly what the code says and what, what they need to enforce uh, and how to identify those things. Um, and we'll take all of the help that we can get uh, from members of the board and the public. Uh, but I think we can make some progress in that particular area with the code the way it is. Because yes, um, cool. there are lots of things that we need to improve on, um, certainly in the scenic quarters and, and throughout the county. But these are one of the, some of the things that we're going to start with. Um, the lighting idea, wonderful. Publix, we can see it in North County. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're coming down here, uh, it looks like a football stadium and it's it's not the football stadium, <laughs> um, but having a more sophisticated set of standards, I think, is timely. I mean, when these standards, even when the scenic quarter standards, it was a two-lane highway. Yeah. It's uh, a totally different ballgame. Yeah. But um, we absolutely need this, uh, and I applaud your approach, not just looking at the, with the dark skies folks, but also looking at how can we properly light things so we address the safety concerns mm -hmm and we address the waste of light, as I like to call it. Mm -hmm. um, it certainly fits with our, our concept of trying to be very green, very energy efficient, very forward thinking, um, and we need this. And I think we also need this in North County because one of the things that we're going to have to implement in Land Development Code is the companion regulations implementing uh, some of the um, uh, military base standards that we put in the, comp the comprehensive plan to deal with our low level flight corridors and those kinds of things. Uh, we've got a pretty intense um, low level flight area in the Mossy Head area and lighting is one of the biggest issues there because um, these guys are flying with night goggles and all of a sudden they you know fly up on something that that's you know we would think would be very well lit on the ground um, temporarily blinds them. Mm -hmm. So I think there is an opportunity to, to possibly expand this beyond just the scenic quarters, but I think Lee's point of this is a good place to start yeah. um, while we sort of educate folks and warm them up to this idea, um, we can move it throughout the county, I think. Um, but the other part that I would, I'd like to get incorporated into the comprehensive plan is just a hanger for this in the Land Development Code. Not the standards, but just the idea 
-hmm. that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. We can yeah. plant that in the comprehensive plan. That'll give us the opportunity to plant this in the land development code. Yeah. That's a good idea. Um, and I think yeah, it's a technique. It's a very really timely. Just, whenever something comes up, they'll put in a little section that just simply says reserved, but it sort of puts everybody on notice it's coming. Well, or a two or three sentences that says this is what we want to yeah, do, absolutely. and we're going to do it in the land development code, and that might give us the opportunity to do it differently in different sections of the county. Um, you know, in our more urbanized areas compared to our more rural areas, where we could have some slightly different standards, yeah. um, but. This is good. We need really this. Really good. Let me ask you a question as far as the rest of the county. When we're doing these Chapter 13 workshops to amend, are we limited to the 98 corridor? Or yes. could this also apply to 38 Scenic Golf Drive corridors? No, um, if we slipped in something that said Chapter 13 applies to the whole county. Well, no, well chapter no, Chapter 13, 13, 13 does. I think it, it has it in sorry. there right now. <laughs> 38 and Scenic Golf Drive have very short. I know, yes, yes. in it right now I mean, so we can't touch at the that. present time the purview of this board is limited to the us 98 331 senate court okay we would like for you to have purview beyond that Thank from you. staff standpoint but um yep. that would be up to the board of county commissioners um okay. but yes we could y'all want to get involved in 30a we'd sure. love to see that okay. from staff standpoint um it uh, needs, would that be at a uh, would that be a planning sure. commission workshop, or would that just be a, be a finding someone on the BC? Well, I shouldn't ask that this, but at what, at what point would the concept of of making Chapter Thirteen applicable to Thirty A? What what would be the point of entry for that idea? Um, talk to two commissioners individually, I think. Yeah. County commission. Yeah. Um, because I mean the way this whole legislative process works as Sydney's probably explained is we go to the Commission and we ask permission to bring forward certain changes and if they say yeah let's consider that then we start the process and if it's a chapter 13 we start with DRB and move all the way back up to BCC but uh, if they say no we don't think we need to change those rules right now then we are foreclosed on moving forward yeah. on that um, but one other thing to be thinking about, <laughs> we're building a four lane highway north of the bay all the way to Defuniac Springs and Interstate 10. Yep. Um, in my personal opinion, that really is an opportunity for scenic quarter, mm -hmm. um, before it gets out of control. Yep. Um, and as soon as we have sewer in Freeport, it will go out of control based on the demand we we're already seeing that just can't be. Uh, develop now because it requires water and sewer and there's no capacity available. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's coming. It's coming, but it could be three years unless another plan moves ahead of it. Um, but there is opportunity for these kinds of things. Um, and we do need to continue to pursue them. I support it. Supported it last time we tried. <laughs> Well, I had the grand idea of creating the Beach Highway Scenic Quarter a few years ago, as you all may recall. I happened to have this wonderful idea in the middle of the night uh, to uh, do nothing other than to declare the Scenic Quarter and its width, reserve all the sections we've got in Chapter 13 now, except for one, prohibit build any further billboards or any modification of existing billboards. And by declaring it a scenic quarter, we could accomplish that. Without declaring it a scenic quarter, we can't accomplish that. Yeah. And we're going to have a video billboard every 1,500 feet. Mm -hmm. um, unless the commission chooses a different path. Yeah. But, I mean, that development's coming. Thank you, Mac. Yeah. Yes. But thank you all. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, what else are we going to try to accomplish tonight? Okay, the next thing I tried to capture the window signs. So I took off permitted and put allowed, and then I require a permit because, you know, if you need a permit, we're going to review what it looks like and if it meets the code. 
and I added in that it's attached to the window. It can't project. Well, Lorda suggested the exterior window surface. surface. I mean, most of these are inside, not outside, so I'm not mm -hmm. sure um, about what she's trying to accomplish there. But, I mean, I don't think we can regulate these like you seem to want them regulated unless we require a permit and we know what they look like, we know where they're going inside the building or, or outside the building, whatever the case may be. Now again, this is draft language, we can tweak it, but I was trying to capture your concerns with window signs. So this is not the red, or is it? I'm confused between. Oh yes, never mind. Um, I'm wondering. I am not even that concerned with signage inside the window that's not affixed to the window. What I'm concerned with is large signs inside of windows that just stay there and stay there and stay there and stay there. They're basically another building sign. And that's what we're seeing mm -hmm. start to happen. Yeah, and, So and, I'm wondering and, if it's more of an enforcement issue. Well, possibly, but it's hard to enforce if you don't know when that sign went up. Because we give a time period. You have 14 days or whatever it is. Well, yeah, two weeks, 14 days. But if we don't know when that sign went up when does the 14 days start so if you have to come in and get a permit you know you got your permit on 5-4 so 14 days later I think that'd be a nightmare Tim I, I mean there that's what the sign that's what it says today there are some out there that have been up for years I mean that's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about somebody leaves it 21 days instead of 14 I'm talking about it's been there since the business opened but there's really no way to police. Again, are you? Mm -hmm. No, <laughs> I'm not actually. I'm thinking about somebody else. Well, there's really no. The <laughs> there's really no way to police that though, because code enforcement just driving along, that's not necessarily going to raise any red flags unless someone specifically complains. Hey, that sign's been there forever. Check it out. But with a permit, and I'm not saying this is the right solution, but a permit, you know when that sign went up, so you know when it has to come down. So if they go by. 30 days later and that sign's still up, it's like, wait a minute, that, that's, that's not supposed Tim, to be there. Tim, isn't the permit currently allowed or am I reading It's it exempt. Wrong? It's exempt from a permit currently. Oh. Yeah, he added the... Oh, okay. It just was an underline. That's why I was... Yeah, I'm getting confused with that too. So right now it does not... Where it says... Yeah, the language... The window is... Uh, the storefront window is allowed comma requires a permit from the code enforcement officer that part is not in it right oh you're right that's existing language okay. but but i'm not sure that's happening then nobody's getting them you're right that is existing language um i thought i added that but i i obviously didn't i don't know what i mean i know code enforcement can drive by a business and tell that a sign inside the window exceeds 25 percent of the window area i mean the ones i've seen I, that's a lot of permits. Painted or constructed. Is there an exception for like Christmas? Like when the convenience stores paint Christmas stuff all over their windows? Or can it just be 14 days? Or whatever it is. Two weeks. I just see all kinds of stuff in windows. I, I don't know. I just yeah, regulation of holiday decorations is a uh, problematic. You might, yeah, yeah, you got to be <laughs> yeah. very, very careful. Rather us stay away from that. Yeah. yeah. But I see all. Yeah. I just see all kinds of stuff. Yeah, I did yeah. add that. Um, I guess I forgot to underline it. And it, it's currently it says temporary storefront signage inside the storefront window is permitted, provided that signage and then stuff underneath. So oh, I did you add, did add I did the permit. Add it. I just forgot to make it red and underline. So where it says requires a permit was added. That just seems really cumbersome. I mean, people are, I can't imagine people wouldn't even think about going to get a permit to put up. Well, they pro I mean, they may not. They may, they may just do it and not come in. No, they're not. Yeah, no. Because <laughs> there's tons of it out there. Um, 
And I don't want to create a problem that's not, I don't want to fix something that's not broke. Right. There are all currently, yeah, I'm sorry, currently there are all kinds of vinyl sticker signs on business windows that are up. Mm -hmm. Like permanent. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm. And I asked. For, I asked for clarification of that probably six or seven years ago, and I was told that was illegal. It is. I think that and that's what this says. Mm -hmm. I mean, and you can I put think, it up for yeah. two weeks or whatever. And if you're limiting it to two weeks um, and the maximum of the two windows and all of that, it. I don't think that you necessarily need to have the, them required to get a permit because code enforcement can tell if it's a sign that, you know, they're going to notice if it's a sign you see that's been there for two years, mm -hmm. you know, as well, that's, two weeks. Yeah, I mean, I, it, seems, it seems to me that focusing on signs that are permanent, signs that are temporary, if a sign is up, for an extended period of time, it maybe we need to change the definition to include any sign that's up for beyond a certain period of time is considered a permanent sign and it has to meet all of the criteria of permanent signage. And be approved. Which includes permit. Yeah. So I, I think that we, we may be able to simplify this more than the, the you know, the, is an example, I'm assuming that number one is limited to a two week period of maximum six times a year. I mean, this is like, you know, Max comment a second ago, you got code enforcement officers with these spreadsheets of, okay, he right. did his, yeah, see, you know, number I mean, one isn't going to be limited to two weeks. Yeah, I think we just yeah. need to boil it down to, it's, it's either a temporary sign, mm -hmm. and we have some very basic criteria, it needs to be professionally done, can't, can't be hand lettered, can't. whatever. Yeah. And then the definition of permanent needs to pick up. If a sign has been up for, and I don't know, two months, it is automatically by definition a permanent sign and it is required to meet, it has required to get a permit, it's required to do everything that a permanent sign needs. But I so all agree with that as far as like a, a for sale sign at a house because that for sale sign might be up for a year. Oh, I'm, these are store, these storefront, You're these temporary storefront signs, okay. I'm sorry, yeah. Not all temporary. Yeah, it's, it's, no, either, no, no. it's either a... Yeah, this is okay. just just storefront signage. Okay. Because that way, all it takes is is for someone to complain or a code enforcement officer to notice it. Mm -hmm. Sixty days later, it's a permanent sign, and it's either coming down or they're going for a permit. Right. Regardless of what sort of criteria it meets. And have your other limits on the. Yeah, the 25%. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All of that. That's yeah. A, temp a temporary storefront sign would have those limits. But yeah. we get rid of all the time mm -hmm. stuff in the temporary wow. thing. But you still got your 60-day mark. And like Tim said, how do they know when the sign went up to start that 60-day uh, clock? The reality of a lot of it's just like parking enforcement, you know. It's when the meter maid goes by is when the, well, the two-hour starts. Yeah, I mean, I'm thinking, I, just, I guess I just drive this corridor away. To well, then you, I mean, <laughs> I mean, I yeah. should be a code enforcement officer. Yeah. I just there you go. Yeah. Part time income in like addition to, um, I just see them. They're just everywhere, and, and I drive it all the time, which I would think our code enforcement officers would be as well. And you would just, they would just keep seeing it. I mean, for goodness sake, literally, some of them have been years. Years, yeah. like there's nowhere close to sixty days or fourteen days or. Understood, like, but I, you know that's already yeah. not permitted. Yeah. It's just that it's not enforced. enforced. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. I think it's. So do we just want to leave this alone then? Well, I don't know. It's not working <laughs> today. So I think the question is: Is there a way to make the code better so that it is works better? But I think well, I guess which is what you were. It's not the way. What you were. Well, what I was aiming for is is that all of these things about how many weeks out of the year, six times, etc. Code enforcement. I mean, I mean, even if we had five times as many code enforcement officers, they're not going to keep up with that. Right. Right. We, we should, it should, just leave all. It, just, it needs to either be temporary, year. or at some point it's triggered. It triggers the permanent requirements, and it, and if it's if they don't come in for a permit, right there, it's cut and dry. No matter what the sign looks like, they didn't get a permit. It's got to come down. I think the the only issue I would see with taking away the two-week period and minimum six times a year is somebody put a sign up 
leave it up for 60 days and then it's you know not temporary and they have to take it down and then they go and put another sign up right after that you know and keep it up for 60 days yeah of course that's going to get them to six times a year so we have professional sure. code manipulators yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> um oh. Hard one. But I don't think that getting a permit is the way to handle it. I think that's, you know, logistically. They're not going to get a permit. Th they're not going to, and I think that it's a, it would be a real burden on code enforcement. Mm -hmm. But he's not saying to get that they need to get no, a no, permit. No, no, what I'm trying to do is up. catch those people by, by not issuing a yeah, permit. Yeah, no, I agree. Mm -hmm. the, the, I think Colleen's saying we need to delete Tim's added language. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I said if I could... Um, offer a suggestion um, one of the things that we found to be very effective on the 98 quarter where FDOT is enforcing their uh, sign regulations remember we had the community directory signs and other various signs and periodically you'd see a brightly colored sticker affixed to it with uh, Josh Rudd's name address and this sign is illegal please call or have it removed within certain days we're going to start doing that yep. um, and I think that'll address all of the signs that you see that have been up there for a long time mm -hmm. um, it'll give us a way to identify those um, it'll give the public a way to know that those signs have been identified uh, as illegal um, and it, it at least gives some feedback to the public uh, and but certainly this board as members yeah. of the public they know the code enforcement has seen that and some action is is taking place on that particular sign mm -hmm. if it's a real estate sign if it were one of my signs I wouldn't want that sticker on one of my signs no. and I imagine my companions in the real estate business would be calling me to say did you see that sign <laughs> they've tagged your sign mm -hmm. um, I think this is more a code enforcement issue than a code issue the, you know, the code is not necessarily Bad. It's the code it's We've the got to get more effective at our code enforcement. We get the beach code well, guys on the. <laughs> we don't have. We don't have. There's plenty of them now. Business permit or a business license. Different in funding. This county. All we have is the a certificate use. of land use compliance. That's yeah. correct. But and I don't know what means we have to communicate with the business people, the people that are actually out there violating these rules. But I think part of the problem is. They, number one, don't know they exist because they don't go around for fun and get on Chapter 13 or the County Land Code and read it at night as they would a novel or, e or play their eBay games or whatever. They don't. Uh, and, and even Some if they do. could, We're the other than Lee, with that disease. <laughs> they may not really appreciate or understand the intent of why, why, why are we trying to do away with proliferation of unnecessary signs on the corridor? Mm -hmm. Why do we want our corridor to have a different look than Back Beach Road? You know, mm -hmm. and, and, and are we taking advantage of editorial opportunities uh, and public relations opportunities and media, but you know all of these things to communicate with the business people in the community. They're the violators. You're you know? exactly right, and and we find that that is one of our problems. Folks come to town and open for business, and they may move into an existing uh, development without having to go through the DO process, so they get introduced to all of these things. Yeah, I've been there, done that. Um, yeah. But I, I think that that certainly is part of our problem, uh, and one of the things that that I hope to do, rather than just defend ourselves all the I time. I think people <laughs> intentionally go out to break the law. But they may. Not I, here. I, we get this all the time. Well, I could do it back home. Mm -hmm. And we didn't think there was a problem with it. We're just doing the same thing so here's we other, back home. Here's your other thing that I hear all the time. Well, I'm going to do it anyway. Until do and ask forgiveness later. Yeah. Well, um, what about and nobody comes and writes them up. When, when you mentioned sticking the sticker on there, if, for instance, if it's a sign like the one you were talking about earlier, this dilapidated sign, if code enforcement slaps the sticker on there and gives it six weeks, and if it's not removed in six weeks, the county goes and picks it up and trashes it. 
don't know that well, we're going to be going on private yeah. property and removing yeah. anything. That's probably a, not our best approach. It's more of a, um, they've got but a we have to give a certain time, time period um, for removal of a sign. Right. Typically, right. the code right. says depending, it's either 14 or 15 days. That would start the meter running. Mm -hmm. um, or at least that's our thought. That might give us an, a tool to use that will help the community help self-police. Because right. nobody wants to see one of these sticking on their advertising sign because it's a real negative thing. Um, well, fines, I mean, if it goes all the way through the fine process, it's a lien on the property. So, I mean, it can be pretty mm -hmm. serious. Yeah, yeah. 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 But we got to well, start the process. Maybe, that's, maybe this is a code enforcement issue and there's no... Let's have every other meeting instead of meeting. Let's get deputized as code enforcement and go out. Now, <laughs> let me make let me make sure I didn't uh, give you the wrong impression that all of our problems are code enforcement related issues. Um, enforcement of the code is something that we are going to work on. There are certainly things that we can do in the code uh, to make that process easier and to help folks self-regulate. Um, certainly, the idea of, of education. Uh, this is what we're trying to accomplish with all these rules. Uh, and as I started to say a while ago, the county hasn't done a real good job of promoting itself. Uh, we've been in the mode of defending ourselves, uh, at least for the last 10 years that I've been here. Uh, and in the meantime, while we're defending ourselves, there's a lot of good work that's occurred. There are a lot of good things that have happened in our county to move our county forward. Uh, we just haven't done a good job of billboarding those things, um, celebrating our successes, letting people know why we're doing certain things. Uh, and I hope going forward that we will have a much better opportunity to do those kind of promotional activities that, I mean, traditionally government hasn't thought about doing because government's really not in the business of marketing itself. Um, but there are a certain amount of marketing that government does need to do so taxpayers and, and utility payers know that they're getting something for their money. Um, if I'm just sending you my money all the time and I can't ever see where it's going, then I start to get a real attitude about sending you my money all the time. But if I can drive by and say, well, this is what they built with my money, or this is what they planted with my money, or all of those efforts are resulting in something that I really like, um, that I wouldn't know occurred because of all those efforts if the government didn't tell me. Uh, so I certainly hope to, um, at least from the planning department standpoint, do more of that kind of thing. Let people know why we're doing the things we're doing and, and educate people uh, or inform people on what we're hoping to accomplish uh, in addition to those things that we're actually accomplishing. Um, if we can get everybody thinking in the same direction, boy, we can really make some progress. Um, but certainly your idea about uh, education, I think, can, can help us. And I think all of what we're trying to do, um, we're all in agreement on what we're wanting to do, but there are several methods to get there. Code enforcement certainly one of them. Tweaking the code so that it really says what we want it to say, certainly with the, in the context of the lighting. Um, the educational efforts to make people aware of what that there is a code uh, and what the intent of that code is um, are all part of a, a multifaceted plan that are going to help us get where we need to go. It can't be just one of those things. It's got to be all of these things. Um, okay, I'll get off the soapbox now. <laughs> Taking turns, Max. <laughs> I'll give it back to David. <laughs> so I think the consensus is we just leave this alone, right? Okay, the next changes are just formatting. Okay, here we're codifying the reverse channel letters is considered external illumination. We've been doing that, but this codifies it. Uh, I added acrylic. Lourdes suggests we also add fiberglass. I don't know anything about it. Um, Lourdes, you want to we have some sign folks here. I promised yeah. more sign folks, boardwalk signs here. You think for building a, a sign material, fiberglass? True. Sign, uh, we're talking about a substrate? Come up. Materials, it says, um, 
This would be for channel letters or lighted sign? This particular one is for the main ID sign. Okay. We've got stucco, painted aluminum, keystone, brick, split face block, routed and sandblasted wood. We're taking out expanded PVC. Kim said no one really uses that anymore. Oh, We're, yes, that's the main industry. Excuse me. <laughs> so, I mean, that's what he said, so we were taking it out. No, well, he no. said it didn't last very long, yeah, didn't that it didn't have a long it. lifespan. Got about there 25 you, had, you have signs, the majority of your signs on 30A are PVC. Out, out, <laughs> completely out those. We've got an entire line that's made out of here. So we're adding acrylic, and Lourdes is suggesting we add fiberglass. Another product that you need to be aware of is HDU, high density urethane. That's, uh, that's the main substrate of the sign industry, is high density urethane. Is what? High, high density. density urethane. Okay. It's, it's what's taking the place of wood. Wood is, um, good kiln dry wood is very hard to get now. It splits, cracks, starts looking bad right. in a very short time period. So that's why we recommend, if there's not structural strength that's needed, we recommend um, uh, HDU. HDU, yeah, with the structure behind it, you mm -hmm. know. Um, PVC. Um, as far as posts, we do a lot of, um, oh, my brain just went dead. KDAT, yeah. Um, What's that? KDAT is wood, is kiln dried yeah. after treatment. Oh, yeah. That's, that, that's covered by wood. Oh, okay. Yep. Do you know anything about fiberglass, David? Fiberglass, I mean, I, it comes in a lot of different species. I mean, it, there's no reason that a fiberglass sign would not have a high quality appearance. It's possible to do a bad fiberglass sign. Possibly a bad sign. Yeah. Sure I'm not sure that as a material it's inherently got a problem. So I, I think the idea of including it's... I don't know. Would fi can you make fiberglass? I'm not familiar because we've been doing signs yeah. in Walton County for 22 years. And fiberglass, can you make it look not plastic? Well, they already approved acrylic, so why not? I mean, it's well, you can make, yeah, you can make acrylic. You can paint it with latex. and. I think they're going for the, the material itself, the quality yeah. of it, the durability okay. of it. Okay. Not necessarily the appearance. You can make the appearance almost anything you want. Take HDU. Okay, man, well, that was my like. concern because I know you don't want it to look plastic. You don't want it to look shiny and plastic, you know. Um, well, maybe they do. We want it to be something that lasts, yeah. you know, that can withstand the weather and the everything. And high quality aesthetic is important. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That's. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's it, and how do PVC and acrylic differ as far as um, their longevity and all of that? Uh, PVC, typically what you have in the industry is expanded PVC. You have a hard shell, soft in the middle, it's hard on the outside. Um, you can conform it, you can heat it, you can bend it, you can glue it together, laminate it. Uh, that hard surface is much harder than wood much more durable. You can paint it with latex material, which is a you know, water-based paint versus solvent-based paints like automotive industry. What we found when we first moved down here is that we have a very harsh environment. We have probably the worst environment there is. Mm -hmm. And people were approaching it with enamel paints, uh, you know, cyan painting and so forth and so on, which started off being shiny, just like an automotive finish. And it looked great for one year, two years, and then it started to oxidize and then it looked really bad. But that was what was in the industry. We approached using PVC and kind of stumbled across a process of actually painting PVC with latex paint, low sheen house paint, basically, 25 year old house paint. Right. Wow. And it looks great, it looks like really, really nice wood. Yeah. And it's done, it's, it's, you look at it and you think, oh. People don't realize it's not wood. Yeah, they think it's, yeah. Wood, but it doesn't have a grain to it possibly, or it doesn't do all the warping and twisting and rotting and all those things that that wood does. You know, of course, now some insist on wood for the aesthetics of wood, right. and they feel they're being green. But if you're replacing a wood sign every five years or seven years versus a PVC sign that can be 20 years, 25 year longevity, 
then how are you being green? You're, you're replacing it right. many, many times over. And mm -hmm. most of the time it's pressure treated and you have to be kind of careful with that. That's right. It's got arsenic mm -hmm. in it or, or copper. So you have to be kind of careful with that. So we try to stay away from that as much as possible. Redwood was the, the, the main factor for science for years and years and years. But it's endangered, very difficult to get now, very expensive, and it just doesn't last that long. But you know, it does in certain areas have that warm, beachy feel that we have. Sandblasted signs are probably the original first signs other than hand carved. That was the first industry boom. You mask it, blast away what you don't want, roll the top of it, and you've got a fairly good looking sign. But it's very kind of old school now. You use it very sparingly. And but um, and, but you use PVC a lot as opposed to using absolutely it. absolutely I cannot believe that he made that statement. That well, is the leading. Well, thing. different sign companies <laughs> specialize in different That's things. True. If you're a dimensional That's sign company like we are primarily, yeah. then we use a lot of HDU high density urethane, which we can carve into. You know, we did all of everything at Pear Park. You got lobsters and sharks hub. and the hub. Everything and, at the hub on 30 If you want a really right. nice uh -huh. dimensional sign, you're going to have to have HDU because if you were to do it in wood, it would be tremendously heavy. Mm -hmm. Right. Absorb all that moisture. Dangerous. Would rot. Wouldn't do those things. Um, <coughs> when when you've got a, you know, most of our clients want very dimensional look artwork signs. Mm -hmm. I mean, right. they're very, That's very nice looking signs. Right. Yeah, we have. Signs that would have won international awards that are in your county. Yeah. You know, because, but they are PVC or a high density mm -hmm. urethane. Mm -hmm. And we can make high density urethane look like wood. Right. You can blast it so uh -huh. if somebody does want that so wood grain, like grain look, you can, we can make mm -hmm. it that way. But oh, definitely do not take PVC out of your code. Wow. You know, what, what I'm, <laughs> I don't, glad you're here. Yeah. <laughs> what I'm wondering right now, under, under the, Design. This is on page six. Um, it lists. It's got a little sort of two-column matrix, and it lists color, and then it describes complement architecture, illumination. See chapter seven. Blah blah blah. Then we get to materials, and it says stucco and suitable substrate, painted aluminum, etc. That we've been talking about shapes and, and address. What I'm wondering is, is maybe we need to add a section because. I agree with what y'all have said, and what it points out to me is it's possible in almost any one of these materials to do a nice job or a, a poor job that's not what we're after. <coughs> and so maybe we need another descriptor in here, and I don't know if it's, you know, I don't know if it's a, we need to get a bunch of signs that we don't want and the signs we do want and try to figure out how to describe the difference between the two. Mm. But I, acrylic is used primarily for lighted sign places, right? Mm -hmm. So you can cut out lettering too. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think you covered them mm -hmm. all and need to add high density urethane yeah. because in the sign industry that is what is taking the place of wood. Because of the trees, that's what that's what's taking the place. So I think, you know, I, I feel that your, your description there covers the main items used in the industry. So no on fiberglass? No, oh, fiberglass is fine. You can, you can use it as a backer. See, sometimes you have a, a company that wants a very contemporary looking sign, you know, uh, brushed aluminum, this, or whatever the case may be, and they want a very upbeat, upscale banks, doctors, lawyers, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. Totally different look. They don't want the the subtle uh, or even major dimensional. You know, they want the, you know, standoff lettering some type of, uh, sort of looks like a channel letter, but not really illuminated in any way. So, yeah, that's still a good substrate. Yeah, I mean, fiberglass you know, will last quite a while, as long as it's painted or surfaced properly. Mm -hmm. It's just like acrylics, like anything plastic, if you leave it for its sake, and it's going to have a kind of a shiny texture to it. But right. that may be what the client wants at that particular time. It's not emitting light or anything, but it's, it's absorbing it. Mm -hmm. Kind of like, uh, I don't know if you want to add to that also, which is you see very uh, uh, used quite a bit up in New England, is it's more of a surface material, is gold leaf. Gold I don't leaf. see that on here. Mm -hmm. um, 
go leafing is very old school. It's probably the very first material that was used. Mm -hmm. I mean, it lasts forever. It lasts forever. The tombs of Egypt have been there for 5,000 years. It was gold leaf. Um, gold leaf is a very interesting product. Uh, gold, silver, very gray, all those type of leaves, it absorbs light and sort of doesn't reflect it. It's hard, kind of hard to explain. But you, when you see a gold leaf sign versus a gold paint sign, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying. And it's very uh, classy. It's very, uh, well, like the arch sign there at uh, Water Sound entrance. Right. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. That's that, that was done from New England. That was a very expensive sign. It was uh, done in old school way, B carved with gold leaf, 23 karat gold put inside of it. Very expensive process. It's not used a lot, but it's, very, yeah. it's a very nice look. Yeah, it's on the arch. Mm -hmm. However, if you look at the other signs that St. Joe at the time, required as far as their sign regulations for that building, that property, they, they required gold leaf. Well, there's one or two now mm -hmm. <laughs> that are, do, are using gold paint. Drive by and you, you will see, see the difference. A major difference. You yeah. can't, it's, the, gold paint is not gold, it's yellow. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's nothing. And what it does with the light is... But, I mean, that's yeah. more of a finished technique instead yeah. of, um, you yeah. know, a, a material. That's not a material, yeah. Um, but, you know, I would like to see that encouraged because it just gives you a real classy look. And this is, you know, a really upscale county. You want to make sure that... And the, and the clients are willing to pay for that. They're willing to... They want the best they can get. Mm -hmm. so and the give it, it absorbs the light, too. That's yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Just wanted to point that out. Yep. <laughs> More gold leaf. <laughs> yeah, I, I gotta say, I think that we might have been focused on on using limitations of materials when what we're actually focused on is a different issue. The look you're you're yeah. wanting to I, make we're, sure we're more concerned about the dimension, the, the thickness of lettering, uh, the uh, you know, it's it's almost. I mean, I mean, almost in this case, it may almost be easier for us to describe what is illegal than it is to describe what should yeah. be legal. I can, I can tell you just in and having been here for 22 years, that you do not want for letters on a building. You do not want unpainted acrylic letters. Mm -hmm. They're shiny plastic. They are hideous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they use it in channel letters. Now yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah. I mean, channel letters, you've got to have the light come through. Mm -hmm. But acrylic, unpainted acrylic, should be used only in a channel letter, right? In, in a, a, a lighted face. Well, you have, there again, you have a client that's got kind of a low end budget, and he may want something just cut to shape for acrylic. Oh, and it's and horrible. Letters and put on the wall. And that's horrible. And in, in my humble opinion, that's not very classy. No. But it's durable. It lasts for quite a while. Yeah, but um, but he's he's saving money because he's not having to have yeah. it painted. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's shiny and acrylic. The color is all the way through the letter. You know, so it's it's not going to fade. But you don't want... That's why... I think that's one of the reasons why you don't have you know, internally lit can signs because yeah. that's the plastic, that's the mm -hmm. acrylic plastic look that you're going to get. Mm -hmm. You know, so for any kind of lettering on a building, you know, then I would say you would want to keep it to high, you know, um, the high HDU, mm -hmm. you know, the, those, um, those materials, you know, that would be where so, so this on page six is main identification signs or monument signs, correct? Yeah, we haven't, okay. gotten, we so, haven't gotten to the building signs. Oh, that's okay. true, yeah. But okay, so same, I apologize. Yeah, but we have the same, the same list. Okay. And it's the same issues. I'm just being clear about, because I'm wondering, when we say materials, Tim, is that the materials, that's the materials of the sign yeah. body? Right, the structure. Sign. Yeah, that's so structure. So what would an acrylic sign body look like well maybe that's not the right place yeah for it. maybe that would be 
appropriate in the building sign but not in the monument sign. And maybe you take expanded PVC and fiberglass out of there as well for the actual monument itself. Oh, no, no. No, no. You no, can, we you use, can make a complete you do. We got them everywhere. Yeah. yeah. For the monument. Oh, yeah. The body. The body mm -hmm. the you don't monument. need acrylic in the monument. Yeah. If this is, is, if this is um, for your main identification sign, you don't we, need acrylic. Because yeah. we did... But when, expanded PVC needs to be back in When there. acrylic was suggested, it was for actual letters, I thought. Oh. oh. On a building. Like, oh. Okay, and that... So you don't like acrylic for anything? I really don't. Body <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm like you girls, and, I, and I'm thinking, you know, and oh, what I've like seen, and I've known y'all. I don't like anything that looks plastic. Exactly. Then you don't want acrylic. we got way too much of it. Oh, yeah. Mm. No, no acrylic letters. Well, I think... Mostly it's been with channel letters because in the scenic quarter, if it's going to be lighted, it has, it's, it has to, be, to be acrylic. Exactly. It has to be channel That's letters. exactly right. So I don't think it's an, it's been an issue. That doesn't right. mean it wouldn't become one, but I don't think right. it's been an issue. Right. But then it's not specifically allowed either. Yeah. The, the thing you would probably not like to have was like Sandy was mentioning when you, you kind of don't want the big plastic sign faces is someone take a four by eight sheet of blue acrylic plexiglass, stick it to the wall and stick some letters on it. Or uh, cut letters out of it and it, put it, it on it a just, monument it just, sign. It just doesn't mm -hmm. look uh -uh. classy at all. No. It's pretty durable. But, yeah. but um, mm -hmm. that would be basically the same thing as having an unlit, just take and have someone make a pan face embossed internally lit sign lens and just putting it on the wall not lighting mm -hmm. it to be the same thing. Yeah. Uh, it just looks a little strange. We got dueling mm -hmm. sign professionals here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, and, you know. yeah it yeah. expanded PVC. Uh, as far as the material for the structure itself, that needs to stay in there. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're going to have some St. Joe signs and mm -hmm. <laughs> lots of people that are going to not going to be able to do the, you know, well, it lasts so much more. Your typical yeah. your typical monument sign is a poured foundation, a CMU, CMU concrete masonry unit. A uh, poured foundation, put cinder block on it, lath it, stucco it, and stick some letters on it. Um, and that's the way it's been done for many, many years. Uh, our way of doing it is a combination of those two. We don't use the cinder block because today you have just a foundation. Tomorrow you got a nice, beautiful monument there because we make it where it's actually portable. You could put it on place, put the steel post in it. If you absolutely had to, you could move it if you wanted mm -hmm. to. Uh, it's also semi-frangible, a lot right. more, lot more Which a, appealing vehicles. as far as traffic yeah. is concerned. You don't want somebody, but, a kid um, to hit a 16-year-old to hit a... But you, you will never have it do what we call stair-step cracks and right. appeal. When you do a cinder block and the foundation starts to settle, mm -hmm. it's not one unit. It's mm -hmm. several pieces, mm -hmm. so you get the stair-step crack, maybe put it up or whatever. But, you know, typically those have been made by the contractor for, uh, you know, whoever's doing the entry signs for this uh, particular project or whatever, because it's kind of a cheap way out. and. Mm -hmm. You're limited too. You can't have any nice shapes or towers or mm -hmm. or anything else. It's more like a wall, right. with stucco. But I mean, it's still fine. I mean, that's a lot do that. What we do is uh, is differently. We either make it completely out of PVC, or we have a two pound polyester ester, uh, shell that we sheathe in PVC because. Uh, you know, styrofoam really doesn't have any grip surface. There's a lot of companies like Peachtree Designs in Atlanta, they cut the entire sign out of foam, hot wire it, spray on a coat of uh, EPS foam on top of it, paint it, and stick it up, and just uh, two guys can walk around with it in, in one hand. Uh, there's quite a few over in Destin area, and those are the ones that are kind of leaning whenever a storm comes through or whatever because they don't really have a foundation. There's not much weight there. They also have a tendency to delaminate and start kind of uh, filling up with water or whatever the case. But they're very inexpensive. They look like they're great, but when they go bad, you know, they're, and they're very inexpensive. What we do is more weighty, and it's a permanent foundation, inset poles, the whole nine yards. So. Um, that's why PVC is still right. a good player. Whether you use it for letters or actually substrate itself. <coughs> right. Thank you very much.
So the fact that you're covering stucco on suitable substrate, that would be whether the sign company, <coughs> we would choose to use more substantial materials inside that. Some would maybe use aluminum. You know, some will use just foam, you know, but it, and, and in that regard, it just depends on, you know, what the cost of, what the client is wanting to spend. But we just don't do the <coughs> budget. We do the real, the most durable. Okay. Okay. Can you just well, your name for the record, please? Yep. I'm Sandy Pafoon with Boardwalk Designs, and my husband, Joe Pafoon. Thank you. Nice. With, very, a very P, thank with a P. With a P. Yes. <laughs> thank you. So, what do you guys think? <coughs> I think we need to leave it in. And add HDU. Add HDU. And, mm -hmm. and, and the gold leaf. And fiberglass. And the gold well, the gold leaf was more of a treatment than a material. Mm -hmm. Yeah, saying. that's more of a yeah. finish. Mm -hmm. Fiberglass, finish. too, right? Fiberglass. Fiberglass out was what they recommended? Or it's okay? Fiberglass is okay for a substrate. Durability. So we add fiberglass, urethane, take out acrylic and leave in expanded PVC. All right, the next um. change would be, um, you talked about wanting the, so well, the next change is just formatting, but under permitting, you talked about you wanted the sign package up front, and it talks about that. It says. <coughs> submittals shall be made blah 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 so I took out normally it just says the proposal shall be submitted with the development review package mm -hmm. to the design review board yeah mm -hmm. <coughs> I think that addresses that and then Jim, before do you want us to if we have thoughts in addition do you want us to do it now or do you want to go through all of it and we go back I would rather you instead of taking up a lot of time tonight just email me any suggestions you have and I'll and I can make the changes well, it might be, uh, we can't really do it that way because they have to have discussion if we're going to make changes to the draft. Yeah. We could compile all of the comments and then discuss it, but. So, do you want me to do it while we're in this section or do you want me to wait till the end? No, let's do it now. So, this goes back to the other earlier monument sign issue. Should we just add something that says the base has to be at least 80% mm -hmm. the width of the body of the sun. You know what I'm going right, back to right. the mm -hmm. electric cart company so issue. So we don't start getting narrow and narrower mm -hmm. bases. Mm -hmm. um, is 80% rule? Yeah, I think that's what yours is, is 80%. I think mm -hmm. cuz it was yeah, yeah. And, and so I it must be at funny. least 80% mm -hmm. of the width of the sun, body of the sun. Mm -hmm. Is that That okay? sounds great. Mm -hmm. Something that's measurable. Mm -hmm. That's defined. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. But, but I think I'll add it right under main identification sign because it says the format shall be a monument sign. And then the next sentence I'll say the base has to be a minimum of 80% of the, I guess it's the sign. The width and the depth. Mm -hmm. All right, that's it. Yeah, that, that, that's good because we talked about that earlier. You met, ready to move on? Yep. Mm -hmm. So the next change, and I don't know if I've accomplished, but I was trying to make it more clear if you're on a corner lot. So now it says the Where's limits page of this uh, eight, okay. page eight under number types one and two. You know, we talked about it wasn't really clear on a corner lot. So now it says within the limits of the storefront of the same business. If you're on a corner, it has to be the same business. It can be one business here and another business here. I hope, hopefully that is more clear. And then we get to the building materials for building signs. And I think from what they were saying, acrylic is, should be there, but we should leave expanded PVC in there as well. Yeah, and, mm -hmm. um, and I guess, I've got one for what do you think? Too. Fiberglass for lettering. I mean, this is... This is the building material for a building sign. Yeah, walls, building walls. And the HDU. Yeah, and HDU is very, very much. High density urethane for the HDU, high, high density urethane. What do you think about the fiberglass? Is that appropriate? I think it would be allowable, but very few sign companies would use it because it's so difficult to cut. Yes. Uh, and it's very uh, not uh, ecology friendly. 
where the fiber is going to be and so forth. Um, they, they could use it in, they're not going to use it in a tremendous <coughs> way, but I'd leave the option open. I have another suggestion I wanted to get y'all thoughts on. Um, the 3 8 inch minimum rise mm -hmm. for a letter that goes out, does anybody support increasing that? I wanted to suggest a half an inch. I'm just thinking about, there's, there's a building sign out there now that's recently, fairly recently gone up, that we didn't approve, but anyway, um, that is, it's just letters on the face of the building nothing behind it and they're they're very thin narrow it looks like a flat sign it looks like poster board up there because mm -hmm. once you're a little bit off of it off the rut when you're driving down the road or standing out in front of it or whatever right. that three eighths inch is not very much and so you lose mm -hmm. the depth mm -hmm. unless you're like standing there looking at it right uh, underneath it so <clears throat> i i like the more dimension to the letter i totally agree with you I was just going to suggest a half an inch. It could even be more, but I don't want to get too cray cray with it. Um, what do you well, think? I mean, yeah, I was going to say, I mean, the difference between three eighths and a half an inch from 50 feet away is not, pretty much impossible to tell. So, it's I mean, I think, if, in other words, if, if it's a problem, I think solving it, it probably should be at least twice the thickness or, you know, three quarters of an inch or an inch. And most, most people do thicker letters. Yeah. But when you have, you know, it's the rules are for the ten percent or whatever it is. Right. So most people are exceeding that significantly. What the letters I see, they're pretty darn thick. But just a minimum three quarters of an inch, whatever you think. Are, are y'all using PVC and a CRC type router to cut letters and make? CNC. Yeah. yeah. So what is the dimension that you can get PVC in? Probably can you get it in three quarter inch? Eighth of an inch to inch and a half. Okay. Oh, wow. When you're talking about your sign letters too, you want to keep in mind, I'm, I'm all for dimension, but the more dimensional a sign is, especially in lettering, the less angle of readability you have, the more you come up on it, the letter that sticks out, it draws your mm -hmm. attention, but you lose your angle of readability. The flatter, unfortunately, the flatter the sign, like even vinyl, you have much more angle of readability because it's flat. Mm -hmm. um, I like to mention, but you have to keep in mind too, a lot of your professional buildings use brushed aluminum quarter inch lettering. The key there is they space it off the wall. It's a stud mounted letter, so you're you know, a half an inch or three yeah. quarter. Right. Or yeah, I have inch. that in my mm -hmm. store, right. inside. Right. right, but you don't want to get too far out because then you've got tremendous drop shadows underneath it and all kind of other problems. So does <clears> three quarters <throat> of an inch sound within reason well, for see, those different yeah. applications? Okay. If you've got a three quarter of an inch letter uh, thickness, but your letter is only three inches tall, that's not going to be appropriate. That's not but these are building be. signs. These are all. Yeah. Okay, that's it. But you can have a tagline. You can have a. You can have a smaller letter. In that logo. You know. Well, logos were kind of. Yeah. Well, you have a minimum. You would have to have a little bit of matrix into, you know, uh, one inch to six inch needs to be three eighths of an inch thick. Six inch to. Eight inch needs to be half inch to mm. three quarter. Yeah, Eighteen inch needs to be one inch to two inches. You know, you have to have a whole matrix there as far as dimensionality. Because yeah, if you have an eighteen inch tall that. letter and it's only a quarter of an inch thick, that's what I was without yeah, being spaced struggling out, with. it's going to look kind of chintzy. Yeah. Unless it's a high quality brush stained steel letter or something like that that you. You know, that's mounted on a brick surface or can they use, a wall surface. And then, yeah, and I think the key. What do we allow for? Uh, we can have lettering up to three feet. So that's that's what I was wondering. Yeah, so and the sign I'm the thinking of, they're probably three feet tall, oh, oh, oh. and they just look so thin, flimsy looking. <laughs> Excuse me. I, I just realized, reading what you did, one thing you do want to change on on, on material. You do not want brass. Brass will be horrible within six months. You want anodized aluminum, most definitely. Anodized aluminum does not 
it's not going to, it's not going to corrode. Grass in our environment will be absolutely horrible. A outside, inside it's great, of course. Well, yeah. that's true. Just like doorknobs and everything, they're yeah, yeah. Corrode and, but you oh. definitely want, you know, scratch the brass and do antibiotics. Well, you know, you don't get a good patina with brass. Yes, you do. You get it with copper. Hmm. So where do we end up? <laughs> well, I think I think what we need is yeah we need a uh, uh, we need a little matrix of the mm -hmm. minimum rise and again I, I agree that it, depending on the material we're not so much concerned with the thickness of the material that's up to the mm -hmm. sign maker what we are concerned with is how far the face of the letter is off the building mm -hmm. so I think the, the language is great a minimum rise. Doesn't mean the piece of material. If, if we were to say three quarters of an inch or an inch, the material could be thinner. It just has to be mounted on the stud. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that gets the because that's Huffing creating wall. the dimension, mm -hmm. yeah. dimensionality. Mm -hmm. yeah. So three quarters of an inch. So we have to create the little matrix. So uh, what's this? We do. So the. We'd say lettering of uh, Mr. And Mrs. Pafoon. Can we pick your brain here for a second? Mm -hmm. Let's first of all let's come up with the lettering sizes. Let's say up to three inches, and then for the little matrix. The, yeah, then three to nine inches, or we don't want to get too many categories. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to stay away. What's your maximum height? Maybe we do. Maybe we do up to six inches. Three feet. Three three feet. feet. But a ladder. Six to twelve two. inches. Twelve to. Right to the letter is two feet. Oh, two. 24 okay. and 24 to 36. Okay. Is the match, is it two feet or three feet? Two. Two feet. The, okay. line, the overall sign is three. Yeah. Except you've got like two three. lines <laughs> attached. Yeah. Well, that one, yeah. We'll go there. Or, a, or a logo. So if we had three categories, we could say up to six inches, six inches to 12 inches, and 12 inches to 24 inches. Those would be the three letter size categories. Mm -hmm. that, that'd be pretty that'd be round. Close. Yeah, that'd be close. And so what would the offset for up to a six inch letter well, again, we're going for, you use the word classy, I'll, I'll use Are that. Are we well, talking about the thickness of the letter no, or no, the, the standing the, off the, the, the face off. of the letter off the face of the wall. And it could be both. I mean, mm -hmm. it could be the thickness or it could be a thin That's material That's your point. It could be the out. material could be three-eighths inch thick or the, it would be a quarter-inch material, but the face of it is three-eighths Yeah, inch I think inch we're right. primarily concerned with that, the standoff or the yeah. offset. Whatever um, you call it. I would say that would probably be... I would leave them a little leeway. I would say a quarter to three eighths. So we'd say not less than right one and quarter, more, not more than. Okay, yeah. got to give you a good. Um, so two. six inches to twelve inches would be not less than three eighths, or we want a little bit. I go a not less bit. than a half. I go a little more. Yeah. Six to twelve. I would bump that up another notch. I'd go from you know three eighths to six inch. How, how, what letter so that, that range was 6 to 12. 6, six to 12. 12. 12 is a pretty good sized letter. I mean, we need to go from 0 to 3 and 3 to 6 and then 12. I mean, I, maybe I didn't have enough categories. Mm, that's probably close enough. Okay. Um, so we had quarter to 3 eighths. I would go uh, half inch to 3 quarter. And then our last category letter is 12 inches to 24 inches tall. I mean, three, three quarter to one inch. I wouldn't want to go more than one inch max. Not, uh, not less than. Yeah. Yeah, because you're going to get shallows. So three quarter would be <coughs> minimum. Well, you know, yeah. some cases that we use an inch and a half inch HDU, and that's a nice thick letter for a, for a 24 inch. They can always do more. So here's what I just wrote down. A matrix says up to six inch tall letters need to be, the face of the letter needs to be not less than a quarter inch off the wall. A letter from six inches to twelve inches, the letter is not the the face needs to be not less than three eighths of an inch, and from twelve inches to twenty four inches, the face of the letter needs to be not less than three quarters of an inch off the wall. They can be more. There's yeah, it can less. be more. We're just setting a minimum, and we're just trying to avoid that cheap, flimsy look. I think we go back to the six inch uh, one to six inch. What you got? Yeah, just up to six inch letters. Up to six inch, and you've got. Quarter an inch. See, that would allow you to put a quarter inch letter on the wall 
technically, and it'd be okay. I would say go to three eights. Three eights, okay. We can bump everything Which up. Which is our much. minimum today? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it mm -hmm. Makes sense to start mm -hmm. with. Okay. Yep, that's a good idea. So then we would say six inches to twelve inches. Should we do that? Not less than three quarters. Yes. And then, logically, I guess that puts us twelve inches to twenty-four inches. Is that too big a spread? We would do not less than one inch. I think you're good with that. Okay. Now, is his terminology correct? The face of the letter. The face of the letter. <laughs> yeah. That would be the front of Not less. See, here, not less. Oh, okay. Yeah, it can be more. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, our goal, the concept, I think y'all picked up on from some of the terminology you used, the concept is, is we're trying to set a minimum standard with the goal that we don't want to stop somebody from exceeding that. If, if they want to do a wonderful sign with gold leaf lettering and, you know, whatever kind of material, we don't want to force them to squish into us. Right. Right. Skimpy. We'd love them to do more. Right. Exactly. Um, but we just need to establish that yeah. minimum. That'll give you a much richer look. Yeah, that's exactly. Mm -hmm. right. Okay. Great. That's what we're going for. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Were you able to capture that? Okay. Cool. Yeah. Thank you again. No <laughs> problem. <laughs> great. You ready to move on? Yep. Well, the next one is the same as the, the, uh, the proposal shall be submitted with the development review package to the design review board. Then the next ones are just formatting. Um, then we get to, uh, let's see, what are we on? Directional signs. This is on both sides of the scenic corridor. Uh, we want to do the same thing. Keep in expanded PVC, take out acrylic, add urethane and add fiberglass so, yes yep okay and then again I got it in there the pro proposal shall normally shall be submitted to the DRB formatting uh, then we get to directory. directory kiosk same thing take out the acrylic leave the PVC add fiberglass and urethane and then lastly, again, the proposal shall be submitted to the Design Review Board. Now, I'm telling people now that you want to see the signs up front, but, you know, the code doesn't really re allow us to require it now. But I've already talked to, had a couple pre-application meetings and told them, you know, the DRB wants to see the signage up front, but we can't make them until these changes are done. So, I don't think Lourdes has any <coughs> comments. No, just the fiberglass. So that's all the, that's what we talked about over the last two workshops. Okay. All right, we got two more items on the agenda. Are we wrapping up the workshop? Yes, I didn't have anything else. Nothing okay. Else. And, um, so, Cindy, we've already made it clear that you're going, or that you I'm will request ask for, for additional workshops. Three, three more. Yep. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so the June first meeting, there's actually going to be a trial in this room. It's going to last three weeks, and it won't obviously be at nighttime, but we can't rearrange the courtroom uh, or the boardroom for it. So we need to figure out another location. Um, has somebody called the TDC to see if it's possible if we can have it at the? They said it was. So if you guys are okay with it, we can change the location of the TDC. Okay. Do we need an action to do that? Yeah, I guess we need to have a vote. All right. So moved. Okay, we've got a motion. Second. Following seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Last item, discussion of rear and side yard landscape requirements. Yes. I forgot to bring what it used to say, but when we, we, when we did the last round of change, we were trying to capture where it says in there, in the scenic quarter, you don't have to have a rear buffer. And it's like, well, we require it everywhere else, so why not there? But we took out some language about allowing a fence in lieu of or in addition to the landscape buffer. And I'm not sure that was, the intent was to remove that language. The intent was to require a rear buffer like we do everywhere else so I forgot to bring the language but we want to 
the request is, and we're going we want we're, we're, we want to do it with the Chapter 13 plant list that's going to the commission. We want to add that language back in to well, that section yeah, about. Yeah, we wanted to clarify if that if you guys intended that in the last round of changes to remove that language. Yes. And if you did intend it, then we'll leave it as is. But if there, that wasn't the intent, while we're making the changes to the plant list, we can make this change as well. And what we what got removed was the requirement of a rear buffer. No, the. At, being able to use a fence in lieu of or in addition to the landscaping. That's what got removed? Mm hmm Because it gave you that option. If you wanted to add more protection, you've got the buffer, but you also want to add a fence, it, it allows you to do that. Or it also allows you to use a fence in lieu. Because the whole idea is to screen. Whether it's with landscaping or with a fence, you want to screen. So it gave you the, the option of in lieu of the landscape buffer, putting in a six foot privacy fence. Does it say, what does it say now? In addition to? All it says is, you just, refer to chapter it, five. It refers to chapter five, which says you have to have a 10 foot buffer um, along the sides, uh, 10 or 20 in the rear and a 25 in the front. It depends on what it backs only, up to, but 10 or 20. I definitely would like for them to be allowed to use a fence. Um, the only thought I have is if you can see a lot of the back of a property from the front, do we want to get rid of the aesthetic of landscaping? landscaping. That's my only concern or thought about it. Yeah, I mean, they could still put I up a fence if they want. recall we had this, we did, we did talk about it. And so I'm not thinking we inadvertently removed it. I'm thinking what, for, for some reason, I vaguely recall that we said, why would we be less stringent than Chapter 5 was, I think, what the discussion Yeah, that was the discussion because it, it, it specifically said in the scenic corridor, you do not have to have a rear buffer. But and we got rid of Chapter that. 5 says everywhere else you do. Yeah, no, I think I remember this discussion. But we got rid of that. So now yeah. you do have to have a buffer. Yeah, see, it just refers you back to five. And five says you have to have a buffer, but it doesn't give you the option of a fence in lieu of a buffer. And I think, I think that's our intention, that, that we do not want the scenic corridor standards to be less, less, I hate to use the word restrictive, Stringent. well, more relaxed than chapter five. But do we want them to have the ability to not have the landscape and have a fence instead? Uh, I guess what I'm going is, is they can have the they can have the fence. They just just like everywhere else in Walton County, they also right. have to have the buffer. Right. Landscaping. I kind I like that. I don't. Instead I think of that's saying what it is. You in other words, have I, to have a fence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the in lieu of is the question, right? Yes. Yeah. Because I'm. I wish I brought it. I just have what it says now, but I'm pretty sure it gave you both options. You could use the fence in addition to the buffer, or you could use it in lieu of the buffer. Well, the whole the in lieu is the issue. That the whole idea is, you and, know, screen and screening. I, 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 I recall that we had the conversation, and, and, and again, what I'm trying to get across is, is that I think the, the answer to the question was, why would the scenic corridor have a less, I'll use the word stringent, requirement than the rest of the county? So it seems like if we're trying to achieve a better appearance, why not? With the buffer is a good thing. Mm -hmm. So today, does it say they can do it in lieu of? No. I don't want it to say in lieu of. No, no. I agree. So we're getting is that right? So they yeah, can we, can, can have we can leave it as they it can is have because landscaping. they can have a fence too if they in want addition to. to. Yeah, in to. I mean, there's still the fencing yeah. section of the code. I mean, um, you know, the, the, the classic example is is the commercial property backing up to a residential, residential neighborhood. A fence by itself is not not, not cutting it. Right. Yeah, what it says now is County Code 50102 applies, which says you have a, you have a 10 on the side and a tw 10 in the rear. Because before it said you could go 85 feet, the buffer had to go 85 feet. Well, re referring back to five, that's the whole side. The whole west side, the whole east side has to have a 10-foot buffer. And the rear has to have a 10 or, or 20, depending on what it's backing up to. Yeah. Because before, it's, that, that's the two changes. One, it just had to go to 85 feet or the back of the building, whichever is, was it less? Yeah, whichever is less. 
Now it's got to be the whole length of the property. And before it specifically says you do not have to have a rear buffer, now it says you do have to have a rear buffer. Yes, I think we did that quite deliberately is my recollection. Okay, then we'll leave it as is then. We just, okay. when I saw that language, I'm like, did we mean to take that out? So we just wanted to get some direction. Yep. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We stand I adjourned. Go, I gotta go lay in bed all night awake. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think it's not because they came in not here. Not. No, and it's actually.